documentary. I got to talk to Brimo real quick about stuff. Uh, Thomas, I have all those links, and I will be back momentarily here. Hell Hydra, I have the HL10 documentary. Here it is. Okay, cool. Got it. All right. Cool. We'll start up Space News now, dudes. Let me switch up the title. All right. Okay, title is switched up. Let me just make sure the audio on this is good. And I'll be back in a little bit. to shape it. Less than five hours from this point of now, John A. Mankey will find himself suspended eight miles above the Mojave Desert. As test pilot for NASA's Flight Research Center, he will play out his role in shaping the future in a wingless craft that looks as though it has no right to fly. Mankey has already flown an F-104 over the test range to check for turbulence and return satisfied. In the nearby physiological van, a medical team is affixing tiny sensing devices to his body to transmit his physiological reactions during the flight to recorders at ground control. Since weeks before now, engineers and technicians have been checking and rechecking every fitting and instrument and connector in this lifting body called the HL-10. Finally, to fill its tanks with the alcohol and liquid oxygen that will, in little more than two hours, propel it for the first time faster than the speed of sound. Getting men into space is one problem. Getting them back is another one. They ride out on thundering names like Mercury and Gemini and Apollo. Batter their way back through the searing atmosphere at more than 17,000 miles per hour. And once through that barrier, ride parachutes to an ocean splashdown. For infrequent missions, a widespread recovery force of dozens of ships spread over hundreds of miles can be justified. But as more and more men are suited up to leave their world, as flights to and from orbiting space stations become more frequent, then easier, more flexible, less costly ways to let them return simply must be found. That's what John Mankey and the HL-10 and NASA and the Air Force are doing making sure answers will be ready by the time they're needed. Less than 90 minutes from now, the flat-bodied craft will be carried eight miles high beneath the wing of this B-52, there to be released as another step in the proof of a theory conceived almost 20 years ago at NASA's Ames Research Center. Up to the present, manned spacecraft have been cone-shaped, re-entering blunt end first, but they lack maneuverability. At first, it might seem reasonable to turn the vehicle around and re-enter with the pointed end forward. However, this shape would generate excessive heat, and more important, it still would not have the desired maneuverability. The first modification was to make its cone slender and blunt its nose, but it still could not fly well or be maneuvered. So the next modification was to slice the cone lengthwise. In effect, this reduces the pressure on the top so that pressure on the bottom will dominate, providing more aerodynamic lift and greatly reducing drag. 
In theory, it should fly. But could it be maneuvered and landed? Ideally, a way was needed to bring down the half cone, much like a conventional airplane. For such a landing, the best shape is shallow and broad. By flattening and widening the half cone and adding aerodynamic surfaces for control, a configuration was evolved, a lifting body capable both of high-speed re-entry and low-speed landing. Such a craft could act as a shuttle, carrying people and material from space stations back to Earth. From outer space, its pilot could maneuver it to touch down at a pre-selected landing site or, if necessary, alter his course and land at a different location. Unlike the now familiar space capsule, the lifting body is reusable. Its initial cost could be spread over hundreds of flights, and the configuration lends itself to larger sizes, able to carry dozens, perhaps scores, of passengers. But a child must crawl before he walks, and walk before he runs. In the lifting body program, crawling for John Mankey means countless hours in this simulator, up to 50 hours for each flight, while an analog computer interprets his every move and patiently plots out the reaction it would produce if he were airborne. And it means many dead stick landings in an F-104, trimmed to approximate the lifting body's characteristics. Seven years earlier, the first full-scale flight test model crawled, literally, as an automobile towed it aloft at the end of a cable. Simple in construction and low in cost, it nevertheless did what the wind tunnel tests had said it would. It flew. Now it was time to walk. The DC-3 towed the lightweight steel and plywood lifting body and its pilot to altitudes up to 12,000 feet. There it was released and allowed to glide in free flight to the desert floor to land at a speed of 80 miles per hour. This first test vehicle logged over 400 successful flights. But all that is the past for John Mankey. As with fellow test pilot Bill Dana, who will control this flight, he walks toward his future less than 90 minutes from now, poised beneath the protective wing of the B-52. Mankey is a professional, long familiar with flight test procedure. That procedure is to increase the performance step by step until the craft has been pushed to its limits in terms of altitude and speed. Lifting bodies have flown before, of course, and many times. The first heavyweight configuration was called the M2F2. On a hot July day in 1966, another NASA test pilot, Milt Thompson, made the first glide flight. Even though developed from the earlier configuration, this was no plywood lightweight, but a fully equipped test vehicle weighing almost three tons and designed to touch down at over 200 miles per hour. mile drop took less than four minutes. One successful flight proved only that it could be done. Refinement, improvement, the evolution of an idea into a working system would have to come from many such flights. From hypersonic wind tunnel evaluation and from constructing and testing a number of different designs. This lifting body, the HL-10, with three vertical stabilizers instead of two, 
was developed at Langley Research Center. Less than six months after the initial M2F2 flight, the HL-10 took its first plunge to the desert, with NASA's Bruce Peterson at the control. Then, shortly after launch, trouble. Problems with the controls. Next, a strange high-speed buffeting the wind tunnel test had failed to disclose. Peterson could have ejected, but he still had control of his craft and chose to ride it out as the ground reached up for him at more than 200 miles per hour. someone has done it, and the moment has been frozen on film. Can John Mankey, now less than an hour from takeoff, put from his mind another moment? A long moment that began a year before when Bruce Peterson again dropped away from the mothership in the M2F2. A moment that continued as violent oscillations suddenly struck the craft near the ground. The pilot managed to recover, but too much precious time and altitude had been lost. Miraculously, the man survived. So did the airframe, to be rebuilt for future flights. But for John Mankey, this is now. Sealed in his own tiny world, he has too much ahead of him to reflect on the past. He knows the control problems have long been corrected. And in 45 minutes, and what will be only its fourth rocket-powered flight, he will push the HL-10 through the sound barrier of Mach 1, up to 724 miles per hour. The lifting body has proved over and over that it can maneuver and land. But wind tunnel tests have never shown exactly what will happen as it exceeds the speed of sound. Only when its rocket engines kick it through that critical barrier will they and John Mankey be sure. labeled a success, though of course he can't know that yet. To the scientists whose speculation made it conceivable, to the engineers and technicians who made it possible, to John Mankey, whose life depends on all of them and his own skill besides, this is the successful completion of another milestone. But in a broader sense, it is just a test, another step in the evolution of an idea. Future flights will go higher, up to the fringe of the atmosphere and return at speeds well above the speed of sound. In the now that will be with us tomorrow, a lifting body may return men and women from space, much as commercial jets land today. Or from this work, some new, as yet unthought of, configuration may emerge. For the moment always with us called now, always changes.
that's pretty neat. Well, that, that actually was really cool. Did you see that crash, though? The guy took a digger and... Because, uh... It looks like they don't... It looks like he was... Yeah, watch watch this from the HL-10. Look at this. Or is that the M2F2? I think that's M2... There was, there was three of them. There's HL-10, M2F2, and X-24. So, what you're looking at here, fellas... <coughs> Um, what you're looking at here is the, uh, this is the lifting body program that led to the space shuttle. These things were the pathfinders for the space shuttle. If you look at this, right, look at that shape, right? And then you put some Delta wings on the side and then one big tail and a payload bay right here. It, you, you could see that that's literally the same shape. It's the same shape as the shuttle. They And I actually think it was really cool because they talked about it here. That's really, that's basically, it's basically what they came up with, only they used a nuclear warhead as a... The fact that the airframe survived is more impressive. Yeah, it's pretty, pretty, pretty freaking cool. So it's kind of like that, right? Right there. It, but like with lifting bodies, it's actually a little bit different. All right, so... Take like a capsule, right? Let's take like a, we'll take an Apollo capsule. No, oh, thanks baby. Love you. So you take like an Apollo capsule, right? And then you take the shape of the heat shield. What does the heat shield look like? Looks like this, right? Pretty straightforward stuff. All right, now So you're just left with the heat shield, right? Now, because with the shuttle, for instance, you have a little bit of a rearward center of mass, you want the center of the heat shield to be down here. So it needs to be like kind of offset to one side, right? Look at that. That's the bottom of the HL-10 right there. And then... That's a terrible version of the shuttle's wing, but. And then you have a body flap back there for control, right? Right? And then. And then you got your Ohms pods right there with their engines on the side. Look, that's it, man. That's how they came up with the shuttle. The bottom is just, it's literally that same like kind of cone shape, but it's offset to the back from where the wings are. See, same shape. And if we go and look at the bottom of the shuttle, you go look at the bottom of the shuttle Where's a good enough picture? There, we need to kind of look at it from the bottom. There we go. That'll work. Look, there it is. See? It's a capsule heat shield shape. See that? But it's in. It's obviously in other dimensions, right? Because it goes out to the wings. But look at it. This, the bottom of the shuttle is just like the heat shield. Same, same idea. Same shape. They just took the heat shield and they extruded it into a shuttle shape. That's all. And they figured that out from the HL-20 program. They figured that out from this, or HL-10, HL-20 came later. One of these designs, the HL-10, led to the HL-20. It was, give me a second, that one. What does that look like? Shuttle had a beer belly, bingo. Hey Grizzled, what's going on? What does that look like? Hank, you got it. You got it, dude. Did 
Dream Chasers, the same idea. It was so they built that one, and then they built the HL20, and then they built the crew return vehicle, and then NASA went through a tip that that I think went to a I forget what it's called when I forget what the NASA program is called when they take like a NASA technology and they transfer it over to to civilian technology. But the HL-20 and the crew return vehicle went to that, and Dream Ch Sierra Nevada is the one that it went to, and they made Dream Chaser. Looks like it needs a linear aero spike. Oh, don't do that to me. Well, the funny thing is, is that the X-33, the X-33 is the same shape. Same shape. I made that thing work, and it worked frigging well. That's why I said it. Yeah. Hey, there's MGB's parts. That ship haunts us all. It's tough. It's hard to make that thing, Forlorn. I could, I could make it now. I could make it better, but I think I've made enough reentry vehicles for a little while, at least on a big scale. But yeah, that was the HL10 documentary. Uh, a little little quick one from NASA. Let me start transferring over the Space News links and we'll go from there. So, uh, Falcon 9 got moved again. It was supposed to be this morning for the L-85 mission. And that is tomorrow, Easter. If you celebrate that, then you get it. Uh, and... Um, And, uh, yeah, it's tomorrow at, yeah, I think it's 940 in the morning. I'll, I'll be here. I'll be here. I gotta wake up for Easter anyway. Actually, that one is 913. So that's the L-85 mission going out of Vandenberg Air Force Base. It's launching on a Falcon 9. Uh, reused stage. 1071 is the stage that's, uh, that they're, uh, working on. That previously launched, I think the last mission that it launched was, uh, L-87. It was another NRO mission. Out of Vandenberg, same pad with another reconnaissance launch office. Uh, launch off reconnaissance, yeah, National Reconnaissance Launch, National Reconnaissance Office Launch. North Wilkesboro is coming back. Really? Oh, geez, law dog. <laughs> anyone remember the time when? Anyone here remember the time when EJ invented something in KSP? What's that supposed to mean? They're going to start hosting races this August. Wow, they got a lot of work to do, man. A couple of weeks ago, nearly, I made a plane that didn't exist. My own design. I made a uh, auto auto rotating. Auto rotating auto gyros with a synchronizer gear in it to make sure that my two blades on either side are always synchronized so we don't have excess vibrations. Then they will repave it in 2023. Hmm. All right. Before we start space, I just yeah, North Wilkesboro, huh? I got back into Kerbal again. Anyone here know how to mount landing gear wheels to tail fins straight? Grizzled, are you are you on PC? If you're on PC, hit two on the keyboard to open up the widgets, right? Actually hit three for rotation to open up the gizmos, the rotation gizmo, and then hit F. And uh, uh, if you hit F, something on your screen will pop up that says absolute. It'll snap it to the world grid, so it'll be straight up and down. You can snap it in th all three axes of rotation to make sure that the gear is perfectly straight. Except the Soviets built it first. Built what first? What did you build first? What are you taking credit for now? <clears throat> MiG-105? I mean, the HL-20 is after, it was before the MiG-105, if I'm remembering right. All right, hang on. Let's check out the NASCAR thing. North Wilkesboro. North Wilkesboro is like one of the... 
North Wilkesboro to NASCAR is like what Fenway Park is to baseball. It's but the thing is is that North North Wilkesboro for North North Wilkesboro for whatever reason Where's the where's the track bandit? I don't know where it is. It's around here somewhere. North Wicksboro, for whatever reason, fell out of favor. They, they ran out of money, so they had to abandon the track. Here's the article. It's near Call. Oh, look, an ad blocker. Lovely. Don't care. You should be able to see it. It's not, it's not exactly a small stadium. Southeast. Ah, there it is. So the Speedway has been basically abandoned since, I don't know, the 90s? It is one of like the, this is like one of the original tracks for NASCAR. Like this was a founding track. Like like I said, North Wilkesboro to NASCAR is what Fenway Park is or Wrigley Field to baseball. And it's cool that they're going to go race it again. That's really neat. It needs work though, man. We need, a, we need somebody to come in here and pull a Cletus. Much appreciated for bugging me that I couldn't get my planes to go in a straight line. Yeah, use absolute control, Grizzled. I, so Grizzled, I use absolute all the time to get parts perfectly spaced because you're snapping them all to a world grid. Every one of my builds uses absolute constantly, for especially for landing gear. Or Vandenberg to space flight? What? No. Uh, Vandenberg. The last race was in 96. Hmm, it's been a while. Ah, there it is. There's North Wilkesboro. That's cool that it's coming back. Band of the track looks to be in pretty decent condition, to be honest. Like, I know that I know that they go in there and they clean it every once in a while. But yeah, this is old school, man. Old school NASCAR track. And this was dirt to begin with. Wilkesboro used to be dirt. They paved it in the 50s, I think. 40s or the 50s. Look at that. The pit wall goes all the way around. It goes around three of the corners. It's really cool. What's what's the distance? Sorry. Sorry. Anybody that knows Vandy, you're probably probably laughing in my face right now. I I think it's a mile. I think. Oh, ha no, it's half mile. Oh, half mile. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. It looks much smaller. It's a yeah, th like I said, fall. This is this is a roots track, man. This is a that that this is this is like NASCAR's heritage, man. I'm so happy. I actually banded. I I'm pretty damn happy that they're finally bringing it back. Wilkes Wilkesboro needed to be saved. Nah, guys. Yeah, okay. All right. I know the Europeans are like ah, just left turns all day. That's boring. Nah. Circle track racing is a different beast. You're literally comparing like circuit racing to rally cross. It's just it's two different or rally. That's two different things. You can't really compare them. NASCAR is different. NASCAR is circle track racing, but NASCAR does race road cur road courses too. They race Coda. Guys, same same for same track as the Formula One drivers. And the Coda race was actually really freaking good too. It was a couple of weeks ago. Roughly five eighths. Nice. Sorry if what I came out sounded like offensive or something. I meant the times where you invented hinges out of thermometers. Oh, nearly. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, wait, what do you mean? <laughs> what do you mean? I invent things all the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Dude. Oh, nearly. You got to see the new thing that I worked on. I, dude, we had a breakthrough in Kerbal the other day. A big breakthrough. I can use Kraken Tech with the robotics. We figured out a way to do it. Uh... Long story short, there's a glitch in KSP where if you attach a physicsless part, you can't select same vessel collision, right? So I couldn't make the gears and stuff anymore because with the robotics, everything is one vehicle. You know, before you had to separate two vehicles to get them to, to intertwine, right? So physicsless parts like, like um, uh, the cubic octag strut, regular struts, RCS balls, uh, you know, any, any of the parts that we're using for mechanical pieces, like hinges and whatnot, we couldn't make those. We couldn't make them because you couldn't allow the you couldn't have them have same vessel collision on. But it turns out inside of the editor, if you attach the like a uh, an RCS ball to a part, and then you go into the action groups, 
uh, or if you attach the RCS ball to a robotic part, you can trigger same vessel collision and you can assign it to an action group and then you can take it off. And the flag for same vessel collision stays there. So, dude, I can make gears. I can make mechanical components and I can make it all one vehicle. I had a breakthrough. That's that's a huge that's a huge deal in KSP. It's that's that's a very very big deal. Um yeah, we can I can make like track vehicles, we could make tanks, we could make whatever. Uh I used it what I did what I did nearly is I made I made a, a helicopter, right, that had two helicopter blades out on its wings. It ended up looking like a mil 12. It kind of looked like um like this, right? I made something like that and I put gears attached to the drives on either side and then there was there was another gear like this and they would connect together on one shaft, right? So that meant my blades were always in sync. I could literally drive the helicopter off of one engine. We could fly the helicopter with one engine powered and the other one unpowered because the gears were driving two rotors. Yeah. Super Wojo is gift, continuing the gift sub they got from Predominant. Oh, thanks, Wojo. Did you ever use mods for KSP? A couple here and there over the years, Addiction. Nothing big, though. No, I like breaking or messing with the stock game. Yeah. I'll show you after Space News, if, if we have time nearly. That was a fun little battle last night in the TAs. Oh, Ren, you were all over me, dude. I couldn't make that AMX stick to the track for the life of me. <sighs> I couldn't, I couldn't do, I couldn't do it, man. I couldn't do it. I, I, I was like, oh no, Ren's behind me. Don't screw up. Don't screw up. Don't screw. I screwed up. <laughs> it was fun though. Those dude, that Trans Am series is sick. I like that a lot. Uh, Aeroflot, Aeroflot is fun to say. Yeah. Interesting in the chicanes. They're great for a track like Sears Point. Yeah. Those, you know where those would be good? Road America. That'd be but yeah, Ren, the reason I was using the AMX is because those are all 1970, 1969, 70 muscle cars. 69 and 70 in the Trans Am series, that AMX won in real life. That's why I used it. But then I noticed nobody was using a Challenger. Now I got to use a Challenger next time. <laughs> anyway, so cool things with North Wilkesboro. Cool things with KSP. I'll show you. Yeah, no, nearly. I don't like making it all one vehicle. Like, that's a big deal. We can make some really cool stuff. And I can make hinges. I can make hinges that don't drift. Catch me soon? Nah. Yeah, probably soon. Mm hmm. So basically, you're making stock KSP as realistic as possible. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, KSP, I try to, yeah. I mean, KSP, I don't... Y you haven't been around too much, but when I... I'll show this just for a little bit for Space News. When I play KSP, or like how I play it nowadays, or how I played it, I, I stopped playing in December for a little while. I've just been taking a little bit of a break. Um, I think I've showed you this before, but in case I haven't, I make my own assembly building. I make the cranes. And I assemble the vehicle on the launch pad, and then we roll the thing out of the way. See what I'm talking about? You had good pace. It wasn't easy getting by. Yeah, I ran. I choked. I choked like I always do. See? I would have... Oh, man. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Make my own integration build. Damn it. I, oh, I should get that working. Mission mode will be coming back soon, guys. Don't worry. I can't just leave that thing. I really can't. We worked so goddamn hard on it. But it doesn't work. That's the, I made Venture Star. That was the last thing I did in mission mode. And I made the X-33 as well. Yeah, you guys wanna see how, you guys wanna know how big this is. 
Um, so you see my stingers that are on the back for RCS? See one of those from that black line to that black line? That's how big a Kerbal is. That thing was gigantic. It was beast. There's the small one. Uh, yeah. <sighs> I miss Crippen Station in midship. I know, man. I know. Hey, Vickers, thanks for the 100 bits. I have that thing on Kerbal X if people want to use it because I don't want it to go to waste. It's a full presser if you want to watch it later. Yep, yep. Really went through the space program. Well, mine didn't blow up on the pad. Or theirs didn't blow up on the pad. Mine did. I'm telling you, man, in December... In December, when I finally fixed everything on this and I put it on the pad and the pad blew up, I I was like, all right, I'm done. I'm done. I can't do this anymore. I worked on that for six months, man. Ugh. So much goddamn work. Why do you seem down? Because it didn't, it never did what I wanted it to do. It basically ended up like the shuttle. It never did exactly what I wanted. I couldn't. I ran out of steam, dude. I, I, I just, I'm like, I, I can't do this anymore. Do you have the stuff from Project Minchip on Kerbal X? It should be around there somewhere. There it is, deploying satellites. Yeah, guys, if you want to use that SSTO, you can use it if you're playing regular Kerbal, and it is damn good. It is damn good. It's really good at re-entry. Uh, gets a little finicky in Transonic because it's a wedge of cheese flying through space. What are you going to do today in KSP? I don't know, KSP. I need to do trade studies about moving things around uh, because I have some ideas for a new project, but what even was the issue with it? I can't remember now. Something with the pad. I don't remember, Banana Time. I don't remember. I was so stressed out from this project. And don't get me wrong, a video game wasn't stressing me out. There were other things going on in December that were happening off stream that I was just like, I can't, I can't give this the time right now. Um, just the holidays and how crazy everything is, like... The hinge is not always locking, yeah. Any plans on May 4th? I don't know, man. Maybe. Yeah, we could just never get it right. It didn't line up sometimes when rotating. Yeah, it's just, it's too much, dude. It's just too much. I could remake it. We could remake it with Kraken Tech hinges and they would be a thousand times stronger and it would work, but... Like... I don't know. With Project Ares, guys, I kind of want to go back to launching rockets. Like, the, like kind of like Freedom or something. Oh, baby. I don't know what happened there. Um, yeah, see, there's the, there's the auto gyro. How do you connect parts together? Of the rocket? Docking ports and same vessel collision. Yeah. The pad structure kept shifting and would recover it every three launches. Yeah, Hellbore, I think that's... I, I want to go back to... With Project Ares, I don't want to copy Falcon 9, but I want a vertical landing booster like that. Yeah. At least for one of the vehicles that I want. I'm honing in on Project Ares and I want it to be two vehicles, believe it or not. I don't know if it's going to be...
I don't know if it's going to be, um, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I don't know what I want. I really would like down mass capability, like being able to bring stuff back down, but also, dude, I love this. This is what they plan on redoing the speedway. They plan on redoing the speedway so it looks vintage. That's awesome. Yeah, that's going to look really good. Um, yeah, Hillness, that, yeah, that has something to do with it. Um, we can talk more about this when I went, when we go and play KSP. Um, what are you going to use as a crew vehicle? Beer, that's still up in the air. I, I don't know. You can make some sort of space tug that just has a cargo bay and an inflatable heat shield for down mass. I don't know if that's too unrealistic, though. Bring Condor back, just modernize it, and put your focus into the super heavy lifter. I'll think about it, Phil. I want something like, like Condor, but yeah, there are some things that I gotta figure out, you know? Ever played RSSRO? Eh, no, not really. Um... I want, guys, I want a reusable space system, to be honest, but I don't, I, you know what I really want? I want something like Dart, but, <laughs> you know, just make New Glenn with LC-36. <laughs> Ranger testing. What is this, Snackless? Yeah, yeah, a vehicle, hey, that's pretty good, man. Something like MADV, just like that. Yeah, MADV would be really cool. Uh, it's not going to be DART exactly 2020. I need, yeah. Yeah, Snackless, that's really impressive, dude. Nice MADV. Could you just do Starship? Starship would be a little bit difficult to do, Vickers. The reason why it would be difficult to do is... Uh, yeah, of course I could do Starship. How am I going to make a payload bay? Genuine question. How are we going to do that? I don't... I, I don't... Like... I don't know how we're going to make that. Like, I have, I have an idea. We could try some things. The fairings are placed with two big ones at the center of mass, so it's very, very, very neutral. Yeah. Yep, yep. Yeah, Snackless, I made I, I made capsules like that. Yeah, I made a capsule. My Rigel capsule did the same thing. Yeah, that's a good idea. Couldn't get Grandpa's 31 Ford started today. Pretty sad about it. Ah, Miller, you'll get it. Fuel, air, and spark. 31 Ford, is it an A or a T? A. Um, all right. Remember, you have you have to set the you have to set the ignition timing manually. Remember that. Right hand drive. Oh yeah, you told me about that. Uh. Anyway, needs a new battery. Not really turning over well. Everything on that thing is designed to be rebuilt. So yeah, you'll be all right. Um. Yeah, guys, I. I want something to do basically what Orion does. Why is that thing doing that? That light just wants to go go off and on. You see it? You see it flashing? Oh, it's not plugged in all the way. That would probably have something to do with it. Um, so, all right. You know, we'll talk about it a little bit. I want something like the Orion capsule. I really do. I think Orion is a great idea. It's a deep space, long long duration capsule like this. I want something like that. But... I would also want to reuse the capsule. 
I don't necessarily want a capsule that we have to go and we have to pluck out of the freaking ocean and then I have to get a recovery boat and then I have to bring it back. I, I would really want something that we could like land on the runway, propulsive landing or space shuttle style, right? So what I would really want, I like the service module, but I would go with the Orion CEV service module. I would go with the CEV service module, which was the, which was the, the good service module for Orion. No offense to our European friends. Uh, the that CEV was a uh, service module that could get the Altier lander into into low low lunar. Um, you could literally see in Orion's design that it was designed for a much bigger service module. See this kind of gap right here? Yeah, it was designed for that. It's designed to have a service module that big, and then they ended up putting on one putting one on from the ATV because. $30 billion. Um, I would want something to do what the Orion capsule does. However, however, it would be really nice to make something like this. To make something like this, but instead of shooting star just being a adapter, that's a service module. However, yeah, yeah, that would, yeah, that's what I would want. I would want that. I wouldn't want, I would want Dream Chaser with like an Apollo CSM attached to the back. The service module can be disposable. I don't care. It would, that would make it very easy to reintegrate. But see, once again, I don't know how the heck we're going to do that. Like how, how would I make Dream Chaser? How would we make that work? What would the launch vehicle look like? Would it look like Ares 1? Would it look like Saturn 1B? I don't know. I don't know what that would entail. What is this? Pembo, two shuttles attached to each other. Scroll down to page 12. Okay. Let me see this one first. Oh, this is ETS. Got you. Yeah. The Hermes trunk. Yeah, Hermes. Yeah, no, not that. Um, yeah, yeah, something, something like this. Yeah, if you're gonna go expendable on stage one, focus on SRBs. I'm not. I'm not necessarily. I don't necessarily want to go expendable stage one, Cynerd. What I'm trying to do, guys, is not. I don't want to copy any particular architecture. I want Project Ares to be my designs. Like, the helicopter was my design. You know, the, the gyro helicopter that we just made is my design. Yeah. I think Hermes would be a good thing for... Hermes would be a good idea. This would be a... I mean, Dart... It, believe it or not, Alex, Dart it was based off of Hermes the most. You know, if we were going to make something like that, how would it would be difficult to launch something like Hermes or Dream Chaser up into space like this? Uncrewed Dream Chaser is designed to launch all inside of a big fairing. And I, with our, with the type of architecture that I'm kind of going for, I, I don't think I, I, I mean, we, oh, there's Ken. I would want to launch escape system. But then again, we could do an integrated escape system, I suppose. It's rotting away in a hangar now, by the way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Falcon 9 with a Dream Chaser on top. I don't know, man. I need some type of small... I want a small reusable capsule. Maybe kind of... Maybe we could do something like Dragon. But... Yeah. Well, Crew Dream Chaser would have had a hybrid motor for a LES. Yeah, that's... Why, Ian? Like, why? Why would you even do that? That's that's taking an idea. That's taking an uh, an already simple idea and making it more complicated. That's why they lost commercial crew, dude. That hybrid LES was dumb. That was a stupid decision. I'm pretty, at least I'm pretty dang sure. Unless there's something I know about it, like they couldn't get that thing dialed in right. 
I don't know, man. I just work here. Hey, King Kitten, 73 month resub. The OG dragon that lands back at the pad. Why not something like the Kraken capsule with a better service module instead of the trunk, then propulsively land? Well, then we would do something like Snackless and we could make something like like the MADV, but I don't know if the MADV is ever was really designed for er, like curb and reentry. Yeah, I can't tab. I don't want to risk it. It's too risky, just like it is in real life. So why did you cancel Dart when it seemed to work so dang well? It didn't work so dang well. It killed Jeb. What about a hovering launch and landing drone ship? MADV is Big Chungus Shuttle. Big, big Chungus. B -b big Chungus. Can you imagine? There, uh, in, there's a distinct possibility that in this timeline, we get both of those. Only, obviously, Starship with its updated flappity flaps. Robotic folding wings. Robotics at difficulty, dude. Uh, wow. Snackless, is that yours? No. I don't know who Black Badger is, but they did a they did a good job. That's my buddy Flag Badger is based off of yours. It's pretty smart, man. That's cool. It's really neat. You guys did a good job with that. That looks cool, especially with the cockpit up there, side by side. That's neat. Like, yeah, I need, I want something to do basically what Orion does, but I'm not necessarily sold on, you know, like landing out in the water and prototyping reentry. Like, but also, like, okay. Here's the thing, fellas, and I, I figure we'll talk about it. It's the space news. Like, I have some space news to share, but uh, here's the thing. I don't... The simpler I make the launch vehicles and the ways to get into space. So, like, I'm literally taking an idea. This is an idea from Constellation and from Apollo, right? The idea is that your launch vehicles are pretty straightforward stuff. Ares 1, SRB, Hydrolox upper stage, moves the Orion capsule into space. That's it. That's it. And maybe you could put a cargo fairing on there if you needed it. But it's mostly designed just to launch people into space, and that's it. That's all. And then you have Ares 5. Ares 5 is about as simple as you can get for a shuttle-derived launch vehicle, which is just yeeter supreme in terms of launch vehicles. If that didn't, if that wasn't English, sorry, that was, that was what the kids say. Uh, it, it's just a big, big, dumb, heavy launch vehicle, like the Saturn V. No, the Saturn V nor Ares V are stupid. They're really cool, actually. Um, and if I go with a capsule design similar to Apollo or a Constellation, you're simplifying operations down here. Like, recovering it with a boat, recovering a capsule that lands out in the ocean with a boat is probably easier than trying to engineer, like, Dream Chaser and getting it to land on the runway, even though I have experience in doing that. You know, I can make the aero shell. We can do that. That's no problem. I, I The building methods that we learned from the SSTO, uh, we can make a smaller version of it. We can make a small crew vehicle just like that. You know? Okay, but what about winged Apollo? Yeah. That's actually pretty neat. <laughs> you know, we, could, we can do stuff like that. You could always run the capsule recovery and that kind of stuff that takes a while. It tends to be boring off stream. Yeah, it's possible. Mine does the job of Orion just in the shape of MEDV, so it's fully capable of curve of, curve of landing. Yeah. Stackless, I like that. I, that's, yeah. I need like a smaller version of that. But I like I like this. That's that what you know your MADV thing is actually pretty cool. And this is the kind of stuff that I want honed in for Project Ares before we even start. I want to know what I I want to know what I want to make. Gemini parafoil. Yeah. 
I'd say a capsule is the baseline for getting people to space and back. Well, can't tap, like, yeah, that's the thing. If I, if we just do capsules, right? We just do capsules. If we just do that, and then I make the capsule reusable or something, which I have experience in doing, I can make the capsules reusable. I've reused capsules before with Condor. It, it, could, it can be done. I reused capsules with, I, re, I reused the capsules with Condor when I had no idea how to do any good reuse, right? This was before Freedom, this was before Dart, this was before the SSTO. Like, without, like, really, truly reusing something. So, <sighs> SERV. Oh, my God, here we go. Uh, I, I want to, I would like to make my own designs. But, uh, yeah, we, we reused Kestrel capsules before and Rigel. Rigel capsules for career mode could be reused. They could have been reused, but we never did it. Um, so... Yeah, the where was I? The simpler ways we have to get into space, the more the more complicated space infrastructure we can make. Like if I just use a capsule, if I just use a capsule, then we could and you know basically simplify ground operations as much as possible. We could um, it it would be it would be easier to do more space stuff and build like transfer vehicles and stuff where we wouldn't have to worry about like reusing and turning around an entire SSTO and redoing payload integration, et cetera, et cetera. But the one thing that I really, 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 really don't like about Constellation and Apollo just as a straight up mission architecture is, I mean, you, you're throwing away boosters. You throw away boosters. I could, yeah, you're throwing them away. Like, what... What do you do? You throw them away. That's... Constellation... Constellation probably... I think Constellation planned to reuse the SRVs. I think they planned on doing that. Um, do I want to expend SRVs? Like, do we... Do we want... Do we want more reusable space flight up there? Or more less reusable space flight down here? Like... I've tried reusable space flight down here with the shuttle, with Condor, with, with complicated launch vehicles, and it doesn't, Kerbal doesn't seem to like that. And even though it's something that I would really want to do, Kerbal, like I said, doesn't really seem to like it. Well, Sinerd, the, the way I see it is that if we start with like just capsule reuse, we can work to making, we can work maybe down the road to make the rest of the vehicle reusable. Uh, we could, like, you know, land first stages or something. And then maybe, probably not with the smaller launch vehicle that we make, whatever is supposed to be like Saturn 1B or Ares 1, probably not fully reusable. Uh, but like even the big launch vehicle, what are we gonna do, make super heavy? Are we gonna do a super heavy? Are we gonna, what, what am I gonna do? Is that gonna come back and land like New Glenn or, you know, Falcon 9? Like. What would we do? Would we do a flyback booster? I don't know. Land SRBs in the water, pick them up later. What about a flyback booster? What about a once around flyback booster? Smirks, why? Like, okay. I like once around flyback boosters. I think that's cool. But once around flyback boosters basically have to get you enough. They have to get you like 99% of the way to orbit. So why not just make it an SSTO? Right, like that was my that was my rationale with making uh, Venture Star in the the K thirty three in Venture Star the IXV with a parachute landing. Yeah, I don't like a, a lifting body that parachutes. Snack list. That's. I would prefer if we were going to do a lifting body vehicle like that that it land on land. But also, I need the whatever crew vehicle we use, capsule or whatever, right? Whatever crew vehicle we use, I need it to, um, I need it to be able to come back from a lunar trajectory. That's what the heat shield needs to be rated for. TKI, transcarbon injection. It needs to be rated for that. At the very, like that's at the very most. Like we probably wouldn't want the capsule, like if, yeah, see, the more and more I think about it, the more and more it makes sense just to make a capsule. It would make it would keep things simple, and we could reuse the capsule. And we, you know, making service modules don't end up costing that much money, you know. 
I don't know much about KSP, but from watching YouTube ground stuff, watching YouTube, the ground stuff you build seems complex. It takes all your time. Yep. I think Falcon's method is a good starting point. Make a launch vehicle that starts off as expendable, but with the option to extend the tanks and add legs for reuse. Yeah, yeah, banana time. My my vehicle would, I would want to have this first stage boost back in land. It, you know, I wouldn't mind doing a capsule, a reusable capsule with an expendable service module with an expendable second stage with a reusable first stage. That would be fine. Reusable capsule first stage, just like Falcon 9. I think I think that's a good idea. So, you know, somebody already said, oh, refurbish Condor. I, I would I wouldn't refurbish Condor. I would I would make my own version of that, you know? Uh, what do you think about the waiver of a waiver for the SLB SRBs on SLS seals expired in 2019? As long as they inspect and understand the effects of of leaving them there, Ali, and it doesn't increase risk adversity, then it's fine. Basically, the seals are rated to this. It's okay, so it's like if you have milk that's past the expiry date, all right? If you have milk that's past the expiration date, what do you do? You open the top and you smell it. You're either gonna throw up right into the milk or it's gonna be fine and you're gonna have a bowl of cereal. Understand? NASA basically does that. So no freedom style flyback. I like vertically landing the boosters, dead crew, because I don't like the idea of strapping the jet engines on the side. You're just one guy, one guy who plays Kerbal for a gazillion bananas a day. For one guy, I think you need to decide whether to be simple and where to be ambitious. Yeah, Cantab, I think we've decided to be ambitious with reusable stuff on the ground too much. Like, I, yeah, I've done it. I've proved that it can be done, you know, and we can, we can reuse capsules. I've proven that you can reuse first stages if you make the right equipment. Discovery, go at throttle up. Yeah, I, I, I think I think that's what we want for Air Project Ares. I want, a, I, I want a heavy duty launch vehicle and a super heavy duty launch vehicle, okay? Uh, ideally on the heavy duty launch vehicle, I would want a flyback, or not a flyback, a boost back and landing first stage we proved that that meta works with Condor. It works really well. It's doable. Um, it doesn't necessarily need to be like a Falcon 9 ripoff. Like, I'm not, I'm not, I don't want to make Condor again. I'll probably make a better version of it and maybe overclock some engines here and there. I don't know. Um, what if you use rapiers for flyback? <sighs> maybe. I'm thinking Uragan style, maybe. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I, I basically want to take the easiest parts that we had during re-entry that we encountered during Freedom, the easiest parts that we encountered during Condor, the easiest parts, however weird they may be during the SSTO program. Take all the easiest parts of that, of those programs, and what worked, what didn't, and go from there and make a really good architecture off of that. Like, I wouldn't necessarily mind if we just copied Constellation, but I don't like the idea that Constellation throws away stages. You know, I don't like the idea that Apollo throws away stages either. They're, they're expending an S1C and an S1B, you know, all the time. Like, I don't want to do that. You know? What about landing an S1C Falcon 9 style? Well, once again, Creeper, I, I would prefer to take these ideas and bring them into Kerbal and do a trade study on what engines and, like, I wouldn't make an S1, I wouldn't make a, a Saturn V like boost back and landing stage. First of all, Saturn V, the Saturn V stage is too short. It's it'd be really hard to land that thing propulsively. Well, actually, you know what? You know what? You know, it could work. It could work. So like how vertical integration worked really well and horizontal did it. Bingo. But I can make horizontal integration work, banana time, because I figured out a way to make Kraken tech. I can make Kraken tech hinges in KSP, no problem. On, a, on all one vessel with the robotic parts. I can do it. We can make that. So I can do that now. Once again, that was the breakthrough when we were making the um, the K92 and the K29X or whatever. Hello, EJ. I went to Huntsville over spring break, and now I believe the H1 and the LR87 are objectively the best rocket engines. H1, JM. 
Yeah. Yeah, H1 was a good good motor, dude. LR87 is ridiculous. Yeah, Jam, did you learn how LR87 is the only one of the only rocket engines that had like minimal changes to it that ran on kerosene, hydrogen, and hypergol? Yeah, pretty cool, huh? Constellation, but with Neptune, something like that. Granted, yeah, 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 yeah. If it's all one vessel and there's no robotics, how do the parts move? There can be some robotics banana time, but. Uh, yeah, the ro it would be robotics supplemented with Kraken tech. I, I, I can explain it later. Like, we wouldn't need a bunch of robotic parts to make the hinges anymore. I would just need one. I would just need one, and um, it wouldn't even need to be a servo. It could just be a free-floating hinge, and it wouldn't be under load, so it wouldn't drift either. I can explain a little more in a little bit. Um... Basically, I can make hinges. We could do horizontal integration again. That's not that big of a deal. Um, also, I got to touch a Block 1 RS25 powerhead, S3D turbo pump, and an Atlas F. Dude, we've looked at Huntsville. We looked at the U.S. Space and Rocket Center JM. Isn't it crazy? How big is that Saturn V? It's pretty impressive, isn't it? Condor Issues killed off the last mission mode. And Venture Star killed off this current mission mode. So at this point, we should pull a ULA and work on reusing hardware in space. Hell Hydra, that's what I'm thinking. That's what I'm thinking with Ares. We, maybe I should just say screw it and you have a reusable capsule. Reusable capsules aren't that hard to do. That was one of the parts from the Condor program that actually worked really well. And we did that without robotics. Remember I had the air brakes go a, tilt the A-frame to pick the freaking capsule up out of the water? I wouldn't mind doing that, but I really like making re-entry vehicles. <laughs> smart, we could do smart reuse signer. That would work with our boats if we wanted to do that, so we could get our engines back. That's a good idea. We could do that. I told EJ to make you a PowerPoint and have a press conference with you. Yeah, that's great. We should do that. Um, I'm just returning to my... Beloved France from KSC. Oh my god, what a trip it was. Standing in front of the aerospace relics gives sensations that I will never forget. Thanks for, for inspiring us every day. <laughs> Nick, did you go to the visitor center? Do you go to the Saturn V visitor center, dude? Tell me you took the extended tour like I said. Yeah. What'd you think? It's pretty big, isn't it? <laughs> it's pretty freaking big, man. You can do boost back and then smart reuse. Yeah, Sinerd, I, I kind of want to bring the whole first stage back. It would be easier. Less steps for... Less steps for integration. She's big, isn't she? 10 meter. 10 meter diameter. Fellas, if you want some scale here... The diameter of the outer ring of an F1 here, that's a Falcon 9's diameter. So, like, a Dragon capsule is about as big as this F1 engine. True story. I've seen... I haven't seen a Dragon capsule up close. Huh. I've seen these up close. Sort of fun fact, in the new Hummer EV's towing mode, it shows itself towing a Saturn V on the dash, but it's scaled down to like one quarter the size. Yep, yep, this is the diameter of a Falcon 9, by the way. So, three F1s next to each other is like as wide as a Falcon Heavy. So, Falcon Heavy is as, like if you're looking at these three, it's almost, this is almost three F1 engines wide, right? Falcon Heavy is as wide as one Saturn V core. It's, it's ridiculous. There is a dragon at KSC and even a Starliner. Oh, yeah, there is. I have seen a dragon up close. Oh, wait. Oh, yeah, I also toured Hawthorne. That's right. I've seen dragons up close. They're about the same size. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Have you thought about keeping track of how much money you're spending in Mission Mode? It's one of the rules for Mission Mode, Granite Heart, for Mission Mode 2. I don't know if you were here for Mission Mode 2, dude. Yeah, I wrote up a new rule set. MM2. Exclamation point MM2 in chat. I have a new rule set. But one of the big mistakes that I made with that rule set is um, 
I let chat vote on engineering decisions, and I basically got Congressed, and we, we basically ended up making something like SLS inadvertently, which really sucks, but whatever. Last link. Yeah, Von Braun with the size. Yeah, that's the best picture to convey scale. And Von Braun was not exactly a small person either. I'm pretty sure, he, if I'm remembering right, he was six feet tall. Is it MM2? Maybe we got rid of the command, dudes. Maybe it's M rules. Hold on. There it is. I, I It's M rules, guys. Sorry about that. I, I, I said it wrong, but yeah. See what I mean? Like, Snackless, what's up? What's your last? When I first saw the Saturn V, I went in the wrong way through the gift shop and I said, where is it? Because I was, because I was right underneath it and I thought I was seeing the roof of the building. Yep. One of my favorite things is when I first took Brimo to the Saturn V Center and we walked in and we saw the Saturn V. I knew what to expect. Brimo was just, she go, <laughs> one of the first things Brimo said was, Okay, I see why you like this. Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> I'm like, see? This is why I'm, this is why I am the way that I am. Look at this thing, you know? <laughs> she goes, yeah, okay, yep, I get it. <laughs> it's true. With Chad no longer making engineering decisions, something like Dart would not be stopped by a crew loss. Yeah, Signer, that's why I was thinking about you that's why I was thinking about like, oh, it'd be really cool if we, you know, made something like the HL ten or something like Dart. I could do it. But that gets us into aerodynamic testing. That gets us into landing gear testing. And that you know, there's a lot of stuff that you have to do. Yeah, that's pretty much the face she made, Thomas, though. Yeah, she... Yeah, exactly, Bill. She's a beast. That was looking at the Saturn V? Yeah, when she first saw it. That's the uh, SA500F at the KSC Visitor Center. That's actually the test article. That's the propulsion test article from the Apollo program for Saturn Vs. It's not a real Saturn V, believe it or not. Yeah, that's right, Metric. Mm -hmm. If we're employing it in small scale, guys, it's pretty easy to make stuff in KSP. The Saturn phase. Yeah, Thomas, she was like... I didn't think... I didn't realize it was that big. I'm like, this is what I'm trying to say! I'm trying to tell you! Look at this thing! It's a monster! I really like Muncrane. Yeah, Tom, that's some of the ideas we should bring back. Muncrane from career mode was a good idea. That was smart. You might want to skip the drop test type things and just strap whatever you want to test the disposable. Yeah, yeah, Sinerd. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hey, Pearly, what's up? <laughs> Pearly Cladipus. <laughs> I like your name. That's funny. I was like Pearl, Curly Plat, Pearly Cla. Huh? <laughs> I wondered for what Apollo that Saturn V was for. Well. When the Apollo program got axed, there were three Saturn V's left. Three Saturn V's and then the propulsion testing article. So four, there were four Saturn V's, four, four S1Cs, one of them being a test article, three being flight ready. There were four S2s and there were four S4Bs. Okay, so two of the S4Bs found their ways in, found their way into museums. The other two were converted to Skylab. The, the four S2s, one of them was used for the Skylab 1 mission, and then three of them are in museums. And then the four S1Cs that were left over, one of them was used for Skylab. One's in Houston, one's in Huntsville, and one's at Kennedy. The test article is at Kennedy. Yeah. Yeah, that's, I'm pretty sure that's right. Why is space so cool? Tabello, I have no idea. I don't know. I just love it. I love it. Rockets are the ultimate. It's so, like, I don't know. I I dig it. I think it's really cool. I, I, I don't, I don't understand. I don't even know why I like space so much. Picks from the CRM1 mission flowing on stream today. Enjoy. Yeah. Yeah. That was, dude. That was a high point for Condor Banana Time. See last. Levy. 
You see what I DM'd you a while ago? Hang on. I have... In the time since I started the stream, I have... 25 new messages on Discord. Yeah, I'm, I'm not making that up. Okay. 26. Respectfully. All right. Uh, there's Mutter. <laughs> 27. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, dude. I get messages left and right. Uh, that's why I'm like always like this during the stream nowadays. Lavi, that's the right. That's the right move. It, it, it's the right move. 28 from Remo. Okay. Sends a 26, 27, 28. Have you watched any of the documentary that I sent you yet? Which one did you send me, Creeper? I have like... Actually, I think yours was the next one. The one that someone wanted to wanted me to watch before yours was Return to Space, and I watched it, and I liked every second of it except for maybe the first 15 minutes where I just blew a gasket and got really, really mad. Yeah, yeah. It's funny. There's a lot of people that lie. Yeah, a lot of people that lie. A lot of, a lot of stuff in the first, the first, like, I don't know, first, like, 15 minutes. Yeah, L liars. What's this one? Oh, Nova to the moon. Interesting. I'm going to queue that up. We'll watch that. I'm going to watch that later tonight. Also unrelated, the redacted three-letter company guys are sending me something from Edwards in the mail. Might need some help identifying it. They have no idea what it is either. Lavi. We all know what it is. Are you talking about the space shuttle was dangerous part? Yeah, what they said about the space shuttle is dangerous and how, you know, you know, we moved to commercial and that pissed off a lot of defense contractors. Herder, I'm like, yeah, yeah. And they're like, oh, they didn't like moving to commercial. They didn't like it. They didn't like it. Neil, and, Neil Armstrong and Gene Cernan didn't like it. I'm like, yep, that's not what happened. Yep. No, that's wrong. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Wow. That's that's just a bold-faced lie. <laughs> it wasn't even space shuttle slander. They didn't even mention Constellation. They just said they canceled the space shuttle for commercial crew because it's better. And that's literally, that's it. Yeah. That's the only part of the Return to Space documentary I really didn't like. You can ask Brimo. I got a little upset. I got a little, I got a little mad. I'm like, that's, wow lie to these people. That's good. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Yeah, Lavi. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I got a, I got a little pissed off. Yeah. Oh, that reminds me. I was looking into why Orion remained as a holdover from Constellation. They kept Orion as a station rescue vessel. Emotional damage. Emotional damage. <laughs> yeah, no, but the rest of the documentary was kick butt, dude. It was really cool. Yeah, the rest of it was fantastic. Yeah, it's great. What would have launched it, though? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Um, yeah, I mean, if we're going to talk about Constellation, uh, I'm not, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to go to rant. Ares 1 was a good idea. I don't care what anybody says. It was a good idea. It would have been expensive because... The reason why is because the development costs for Ares 5 were roped into Ares 1 because Ares 1 uses Ares 5 parts. That's why it was expensive. That's it. 
They saw the price tag, they said, hell no, commercial can do it for cheaper, not entirely realizing that they gutted our national space program. We sacrificed the Constellation program on the altar to commercial. And NASA has been floundering pretty much since. Not floundering, that's not the right way to say it, but they don't have any in-house space program since. They're beholden to, even now, even 10 years later, they're beholden to a, a, a commercial provider to get people to their own space station. Yeah, that's the short story. That's the short story, and I'm leaving it at that. Let's get back to talking about KSP architecture. We will right those wrongs, all right? I actually was thinking about it. One of the things that I wanted to do for Project Ares was just make Ares 1 and Ares 5. Just make it. Just make that. Use all expendable launch vehicles with a reusable capsule. SRB first stages, liquid fuel second stages that could be reused, but are simple in design and most likely expendable. Uh... Yeah, I kind of ended up taking the space news to talk about trade studies for KSP, but people can learn about space flight here. Like, you you know, you can learn about it. That's why I voted for it. Yeah, apatoxin. I was thinking about just doing that. Um, but I, I would like to, you know, now that I'm thinking about it, like, I, I wanted to just copy Constellation, but I don't... People... Uh, something that I get a lot of is that people want to see my own designs, like the cigarette, like the cigarette first stage, free to, the Freedom 10 uh, flyback first stage with the Taurus wing. That was cool. Robert Parker during the stream. Yeah. Uh, Hell Hydra, I'm not doing it today. We don't need to do it today. They, they saw Constellation and they got cold feet because they realized it was going to be super expensive and it needed a lot of money and they wanted to put that other money to other things. That's it. That's the short story. I'm not going... I'm not saying anymore. Um... Why not just start where Constellation ended and continue where it would have gone? Well, I want to do that. I want to do that hired, but I also want to reuse my first stages. I want. I would like to see, like, instead of just copying Constellation, or instead of just copying Condor, or instead of just copying Apollo, like what basically what I did during the career mode saves, I want to piece it all together. Let's piece it all together. If you had Falcon 9, or a vehicle like Falcon 9, and you had a vehicle like SLS, and just exclude Starship from this one analogy. Starship would be the one vehicle that would be amazing at doing everything. And I wouldn't necessarily, like, maybe we could do that. Maybe we could do that. But if we were coming up with an integrated architecture, Falcon 9 notwithstanding, how would we do this? Like, say, we're talking about, like, regular rockets, like convention, not, like, not, not Starship, like, because once again, if I'm going to make Starship, I don't need another launch vehicle. Starship could literally do everything. Or we could do Ares 1. I could do Ares 1 and Starship and use Starship in an uncrew capacity. Man, that would piss a lot of people off. That would piss off the SLS people. That would piss off the Starship people. Because, you know, no crew on Starship. It would only be used for cargo because it's not safe not safe. That would piss them off. I would use Ares 1, which the people that like Starship hate Ares 1. That would piss them off. I would piss off the Constellation people because I never made Ares 5. That would piss them off. Ooh, that's a good idea. <laughs> that's a good idea. <laughs> that would do, we just we just pissing everybody off today. No. Um, I agree, granted. I think Ares 1 is a good, good idea. Did you see that Burger Level Time article on SLS? Which one, Phil? The one by Kl Jeffrey Kluger? I like the Twitter thread that happened as a result of that. That was pretty funny. Not to prolong CSP convo any further, but relevant, relevant link for what I brought up. Last paragraph under the Constellation program. Okay, who wrote this? Let's see. This was from April 15th, 2010. NASA's original idea for replacing the shuttle was a new family of rockets and spacecraft designed not only to carry astronauts back and forth to Earth orbit, but to eventually transport human explorers to the moon and beyond. An advisory panel that looked into the future of human spaceflight found that the Constellation program had been long underfunded. I can't, Labby, I can't do this. And behind, behind schedule to meet any of its goals. Yeah, that's what happens when said advisory panel, or the people that started said advisory panel, underfunded for two years. We've investigated ourselves, and we've found no wrongdoing. 
Based off of those findings, a new budget was proposed that would pull the plug on the program. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, Phil. Yeah. Funny how that works. It's very interesting. Very interesting, that one. How folks at NASA, you know, have to talk good about a program even though they don't support it. You think someone would do that? Just be in charge of a spaceflight organization where they don't like the, uh, where they don't like the rocket that they're supposed to be supporting? Huh. Interesting. 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 Hmm. Hmm. The last paragraph of that section was important. All right. All right. All right. All right. What's the last paragraph? Lavi, I read, didn't, didn't you link this last night? I read this last night. With Thursday's announcement, the president, and keep in mind this article's from 2010, the president ordered NASA to revive one component, the Orion Crew Exploration Vehicle, reinvented as an on-call rescue vehicle for orbiting space crews. Oh, God. Okay. Okay. Hey, human. I can see you. Hello. V Gates. Do it, EJ. Let's talk about it. No, no. Let's let's figure out. Let's. Huh. I talked so much about the the problems with how SLS and Constellation came around. How about we come up with a spaceflight architecture for Kerbal that remedies these problems? Yeah, part of that smell felt like a smack, smack in the face. Yeah, Lavi, I remember. Like, don't take this the wrong way. You were probably too young to remember it at the time. I remember reading articles about people saying how like oh yeah we're going to use Orion as a rescue vehicle for the I, you know for the ISS and then the you know people would be like oh what are you going to send it on oh we'll send it on SLS i'm sitting here and i'm like okay no brimo i'm good Yeah, no, I, mean, I, re I remember. Okay, guys, part of the reason why I'm so, like, I will never, I will never not take a moment. I will never not take a moment to talk about er erroneous policy in spaceflight because, dude, it sucked. I'll, I'll say it once, I'll say it again. Being a spaceflight fan 10 years ago, not fun. Not fun. It's not like it is now. Hey, Bobber, what's going on? I myself have come to terms with the M with MS, and now I'm losing weight. I already lost thirty. Hey, congratulations, dude! It look, it's something you got to live with, but you it, you you'll be all right. You'll be all right, man. That's that's what I said. As I said that like three weeks ago. You'll be all right, dude. It's okay. That's good, man. Good for you. Yeah, fellas, it sucked. It sucked being a spaceflight fan. It, it it sucked. It wasn't fun. We weren't... And you know what? To be fair, the, the Return to Space documentary on Netflix talked about this. They came to the wrong conclusions. Like, your conclusions were all wrong. I've read... I've seen this documentary. Your conclusions were all wrong. They acted stupidly. What books have you written? You can anger more people. There's still the crew shouldn't launch on SRB's crowd. If you make SRB, X, and Omega... Yeah, sign nerd, that's right. Why settle on one type? Why not take the best from Apollo, Constellation, SLS, Starship, and create your own? Hey, Steve, that's pretty much what I'm going to do. That's why I don't want to copy Constellation. I've done that already. I want to take the best... I want to take the best ideas that we have about reusing things in KSP, the best ideas about expending things in KSP, and the best ideas we've done about la with launch pads in KSP... And I want to combine that all together and then take the best ideas from all my past space programs and engineer literally an end-all, be-all, conventional-style rocket architecture that's really focused more on up there. He said more on. More on up there, less down here. We know what works on the ground and what doesn't. We know that. We know what works. We've already been there. You know? I know, I know what architecture I need to get stuff done quickly and efficiently on the ground. The Freedom Rockets are a good example of that, right? Yeah. 
I got in immediately after all that, which sucked too. The shuttle came to LA. Yeah, oh, Lavi, I've been, I've been meticulously following space flights since probably around 2011, 2012, like right around the time I started streaming. Uh, but I've been a space flight fan a long time. I remember, like, I remember reading Popular Mechanics magazines in the library 15, 20 years ago and reading about, you know, X-33, Venture Star, Constellation. I remember watching the Discovery Channel when it was still about science and they were talking about con the Constellation program and, you know, uh, how, you know, the shuttle could be replaced by something like Venture Star and then NASA could go explore the moons and the planets and by 2020 we could be, we could have a base on Mars, etc., etc. Daddy Elon single-handedly brought back space flight enthusiasm. Yeah, killer. If I have to give the folks that wanted to cancel Constellation credit, that's where credit is due. They recognized that Elon was chomping at the bit to do stuff like this, and they knew that he would do a good job. That that was correct. I've I've oftentimes criticized, you know, by canceling Constellation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, you know, but the, the, them championing commercial space flight. It's specifically SpaceX was a good idea. That was a good call. That that was the that was probably the right move for the time. I'll admit, but axing, but I don't know. Is it worth sacri Was it worth sacrificing Constellation? I, I I I firmly believe that that was that was the wrong. That was a bad thing. And NASA themselves are feeling the repercussions of that. SpaceX are not. But the thing is, is that. <clears throat> The commercial orbital transport services, Falcon 9, was going to happen anyway. Guys, the, the Falcon 9, SpaceX had payloads delivered to the space station on the shuttle for Falcon 9. This was way before Constellation got canceled. Way before it. The, the contract that NASA awarded SpaceX that saved SpaceX was a contract from the Constellation program. This is before the people that got in... That got that started running NASA that wanted to cancel Constellation. That contract was awarded before they were even there. That's the part. That's the part of that return to flight documentary. I don't like. I don't like that. They didn't even mention Constellation. They didn't mention they, 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 the 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 way they say it is like, oh yeah, we canceled the shuttle and we came up with commercial crew to replace it as a, you know, because that's a much better solution. It's better for the taxpayers. It's like. Mm -hmm. No, <laughs> no, that's not, that's not, they, like, they lied, fucking lied, man, <laughs> they, they lied, blatantly, like, wow, <laughs> that's, wow, that is a bold-faced lie. Should start with disposable and get moving, yeah, I agree, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm -hmm. technically no space program is best for the taxpayer in the short term. Something like that, Ga. Yeah, well, if you Ga, if you go and look around, it's not even Rule Eight. It's not even Rule Eight. It's literally Dunning Kruger. Seriously, a couple of people that came into NASA had an idea about what's good for NASA, and they literally disagreed with the president. Yeah. Yeah, and went behind the backs of like NASA administrators and the executive branch to get Constellation canceled. They went out of their way to get Constellation canceled. Unconstitutionally. They went behind Congress's back. Why do you think Congress freaked out and made SLS? You know that Project Constellation had like overwhelming like 95% support in Congress, right? Everybody knows this, right? Even up until the point where it was canceled. Interesting, huh? I don't know what you're talking about, Phil. So when is the wet dress rehearsal and liftoff? Janet, really, they have to... Okay, this is going to be an intentionally vague answer because I don't even think NASA knows what they're going to do right now. They have to They have to look at the data. They have to look at what caused, whatever, what caused the uh, TSMU uh, hydrogen catch can leak. They have to look at it and they have to <clears throat> figure out if... You know, if that was a one-time thing, was it an isolated incident? What happens when they do it again? Will it leak again? Is there something wrong with the parts? Uh, 
So, I don't know. It could be anything. Um, I don't think they're going to... I, I don't know. They, they basically have to get people out there and physically look at the rocket. Like, you have to physically look and you have to make sure that your telemetry is matching the physical, the physical rocket. It could be just something as simple as, a, a, as like an O-ring didn't seat correctly on the, on the catch can TSMU or something. Or the perforations in the, the, the catch vessel for catching ga uh, hazardous gases aren't working correctly. Or, they're, or they sealed or they got clogged with ice or something. There's a bunch of, there's a bunch of things that it could be. They have to figure out what caused that leak. <clears throat> you can't have hydrogen leaks, which is funny because hydrogen leaks are really easy. Uh, 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 hydrogen leaking around on a rocket is about as simple as spilling water in a bucket with holes. Yeah. Yeah, it's that simple. <laughs> yeah, Novus, it's... Uh, <clears throat> like I said... It sucked being a spaceflight fan. Like, I'm not going to sit here and say that that really traumatized me. But, yeah, I'm... That's why I'm so damn vocal about it. Because, dude, nobody wants this. Trust me. No one wants that. Anybody that was a spaceflight fan knew at the time. Everyone knew that was a bad idea. Y you know? And I'm, <clears throat> I'm just happy we got... I'm happy that NASA, you know we got SpaceX out of it. That was like, that's the best part. And don't get me wrong, that is a really good thing. I'm not going to sit here and pretend like it's not. That's a really good thing. But I don't think we, I don't think, <clears throat> I don't think that we needed to sacrifice as much as we did to make SpaceX successful. Um, I don't think we needed to. I think, yeah. I, I think we there, we could have kept doing Constellation and also had commercial crew. I mean, or kept the shuttle going. We could have done that too. Uh, but no, because, you know, they, they rolled back the shuttle, canceled Constellation, gave us, Congress freaked out, and as a visceral reaction, they mandated it by law that SLS get made, and there was nothing NASA could do about it because, once again, <clears throat> some folks at NASA went behind people's backs and canceled it. Like some, dude, it's pretty nefarious stuff. Uh, and Congress freaked out. They're like, the hell, you're canceling it. No, you're not. We're going to make it law. We're going to make it law that you're not canceling it. And that's what they did. And that's why we, had a, we, we ended up with a rocket that was engineered by Congress. Because there were folks at NASA 10 years ago that just wanted to pull the plug on the whole thing and Congress freaked the frick out. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I know. Funny how that works. <clears throat> I'm not one to say that Congress was in the right here. That's not a phrase that comes around much nowadays, but they were absolutely in the right there. In you know, Bill Nelson was there, like, saying, like, no, this is stupid. You're you're going to put thousands of people out of work if you cancel these programs. And it's, like, 2010. We're still coming out of the recession. Like, this is a really stupid idea. And then everybody went after him and Richard Shelby and John Colbertson and all these other guys saying that they're the bad guys. Pork, pro pork, pork projects. Blah, blah, blah. It's just a jobs program. Like... Like Neil Armstrong and Gene Cernan said the same thing that said the same thing that Bill and Richard Shelby and John Cobertson and all those other guys were saying at the at the same time. They testified to Congress. Neil Armstrong testified to Congress. He didn't even do that during the Apollo program. He, Neil wanted nothing to do with politicians. Neither did Gene. Do you know how badly you have to screw up to come out for to had to have had to have Neil Armstrong come out and say you're wrong, <laughs> like in a congressional testimony? Oh, Johnny, did you back the wrong hose? Would you back the wrong... Would you hose him, please? Hose him. <clears throat> anyway. Like, those... Like, and, you know, it's still funny. Ten years on. Ten years on, people are still saying the same thing. SLS is unsustainable. These guys are bad. All they want to do is protect the, their pork products. They want to represent their constituents. How dare they? Like, oh my god. 
It's, it's a little ridiculous, right? <laughs> Look, man, I could think I'm 130% right about something in space flight. If Neil Armstrong knocked on my door and he says, no, you're wrong, I'm listening. And Gene Cernan, the, literally the first and last guy to touch the freaking moon, saying you're wrong. Uh-oh. Uh <laughs> it's almost like they had some say in developing useful spaceflight architecture. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, Shaw, I know. I know. It's funny. Because people still, people still, you know, get up certain, you know, congressmen's tails that want to keep NASA facilities open. They still get up to him. Certain people still write articles about him saying they're the bad guy. Like, huh. Okay. Uh, Return to Space, Graf Shark. Yeah. Watch the first 15 minutes of the Return to Space documentary. You want to get annoyed? That'll get you annoyed. You know what we should do? Revert Machute to 2012. More NASA movie studios. Lavi, who in their right mind thought it was a good idea to convert a NASA facility into a goddamn movie studio? How could, how could you be that out of touch? Oh my god. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's, it's hilarious, dude. But anyway. <clears throat> Wait, what? Guys, you want to see up? Look. I'm telling you. I'm not... I'm not just here, I don't, I'm not here on the front lines every day, and I know I bore people to death with this stuff. I'm not here on the front lines every day, you know, on the internet, telling people about how this stuff works and how much it sucked. Look, this was an article that was released by Chris B. I, I remember reading this damn thing when it came out. When it, when it came out, look, that's the kind of headlines we got after the shuttle and Constellation got canceled. Oh, great. But they are like that now, now there is more hype for space, right? Right? Yeah. What's the issue with it? Just watch the first 15 minutes, Grab. I won't say, I'm not telling you what to think. You watch the first 15 minutes and you see if there's anything weird about it. Um, yeah, yeah, they wanted to just film movies in Michoud. They want to make it into a movie studio. I'm telling you, man, it was frustrating. It was frustrating. You guys are lucky. A lot of you guys are here because you became Spaceflight fans after that. Holy crap, was it hard. It was difficult. I just... I remember seeing Atlantis land for the last time, and I just... I, dude, I got mad. I'm like... It, I wasn't... I wasn't, like, sad. I was pissed. Like, not even like, oh, oh my god, Atlantis, you know, that's the last flight. No, I was mad. I'm like, this is dumb. This is a stupid decision. We shouldn't do this. This is really, really dumb. We have no way to get back into space. This is stupid. Like. You know, like, it's. I, I, I was just disdain. Like, pure disdain. Like. You know the type of feeling you, when, you know, your parents, when you do something really stupid, and it seemed like a good idea at the time, and, like, your parents are like, I'm not mad, I'm just disappointed in you. And you're just that, ugh, 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 that, just, <clears throat> that, that just, <sighs> like, you're not, you're not upset. You're pissed at yourself. Like, oh man, yeah, why did I do that? That was stupid. What am I doing? Like, it's like that kind of feeling, but you don't have any control over it, you know? That's called stages of grieving. Definitely, EJ definitely went through that too. Yeah, right, Grab? It sucks so much more. You're so right. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what it was like, man. It hurt. It hurt a lot. And I'm not going to sit here and... You know, I say that, you know, like I hold space flight super freaking dear to my heart, right? Like part of the thing, you know, Elon has it right. You know, it's something that you get up in the morning and you're like, yes, you know, yeah, space flight, we're doing stuff, you know, 
and have that all go down the drain, man, that really, really sucked. You know, it was it wasn't fun. And that's what that's why I am the way I am. Maybe I'm maybe you know, maybe I'm overreacting a little bit, but everybody thought constellation was going to happen and then it was gone. And then the shuttle right after that. Like I understand now why in 72 when the shuttle when they said no, we're not using Saturn V anymore, we're going to use the shuttle. Why literally everyone at NASA said, <laughs> all right, I'm leaving. Bye. <laughs> oh, nothing, Victory. We're just we're just talking about when uh, the shuttle stopped flying. It, it hurt, man. It really hurt. It felt like the job was unfinished, you know? It's like... It's like when you leave a job, right? You leave a job for a better job, and, well, not even for a better job. Like, you, you say, like, uh, you know, maybe you leave a job for, like, school or something, and, you know, you're on your way out, and you know that there's, like, stuff at that job that's not going to get done. It's not going to get done because, you know, you're not going to be there. You're going to be doing something else, and you know that it's going to suffer because you're not there, but then you remind yourself, like, you know, I'm leaving this job for a reason, right? But also, it's like, it just felt, it just feels unfinished. Hey, Nivia, what's going on? Yeah, that's true, Ga. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Rocket Guy, there you go. NASA was SLS wasn't designed by Congress, just mandated generalized requirements, lift tonnage. The, the problem was that the lack of direction from, from the executive branch followed by a flat budget in the years following. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I mean, the, the mandated... Mandated generalized requirements, Novus, yeah, like... That's what I mean when I say it was designed. But yeah, like, you basically, you know, it wasn't designing it for a task. It was designing, it was mandated by design, right? Like, last if you can, no worries if not. What's up, Grav? Anyway, like, guys, I, I said I didn't want to get into this, you know. Disappointment sucks so much, so much more. That's why instead of flipping people off on the road, I, th I thumbs down them. It makes them think it's not a bad idea. You know? Yeah. Wrong one missed the actual last. I don't want to miss this convo, so I'll go watch the first 15 minutes return to space after space news. But any TLDR on what to watch for, you'll know it when you see it, dude. Just listen. Just listen to when they talk... Okay, grab. Listen to when they talk about how the shuttle program ended and stuff. Yeah. Just listen to that part. <laughs> Caveman, yeah. Planning on seeing tomorrow's SpaceX launch at Vandenberg. Nice, Funky. There you go. I will forever hold Bolden as the worst NASA administrator. Rocket guy, it wasn't him. It wasn't, it wasn't him. Dude, I'm telling you, it wasn't him. You gotta, like, dude, I'll, I'll show you some stuff. It wasn't him. It wasn't Charlie. What happened to KSP before GTA? Uh, I took it out of the title shot, but yeah, we can go back to it. I mean, yeah. Yeah, yeah, Rocket Guy. Look at look and see what Novus said. Yeah. <clears throat> anyway. Let's let's discuss what space news we have today. Um, and then we'll go from there. There there isn't much, guys. So we'll we'll jump back into theory crafting about architecture for KSP and we'll go from there. Um it always falls to the lead in your eyes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is why I love Jim so much. Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, I grab. I mean, part of, yeah, part of it was, you know, freaking, you know, they, the executive branch let him do it. They let him do his thing. That's, that's really it, because, yeah, they let him do his thing. Are you streaming the launch tomorrow? No, no, Canuck, I'll be here. It gives me a good excuse to wake up and on Easter, because Sundays I usually sleep in or watch the Formula One race. So it gives me a, gives me an excuse to, 
to wake up. I'll be here. I will be here. I might have to take a break after GTA before the launch, but I'll be here. Yep, yep. I was skeptical because of Jimmy's out of the park. Yeah, Grav, he, he exceeded expectations. Yeah. Jim's in the Return to Space documentary, Grav Shark, a lot. Yeah, he's in the he's in the Return to Space documentary. Yeah. Cool. Um F1 smiles. Apologies, it's just too funny. Mika Hakkinen on Lewis Hamilton. What is he saying about him? I wonder how Lewis behaves in team meetings. I bet he's sulking? I can't imagine it. Lots of complaining and whining. This starts the natural thought process of drivers. Should I go somewhere else? Oof. Yeah, Mika, maybe. Yeah, Green. He, Jim, Jim was really good. I really wish he was still there. But I understand this. You know, that's, hey, administration. He said he wasn't the right guy for the job. And he put Bill in. And you know what? Like, you know, Grab, we can say whatever we want about Bill. Bill helped Jim come up with the Artemis program. He, he was instrumental in helping being on the National Space Flight Council as an advisor to give SLS the missions that it was supposed to have when they made it. You know, like, after, after Bill lost his Senate seat in 2018, he, Jim, immediate, Jim and NASA immediately scooped him up. Like, the next day, they gave him a call, like, hey, come, come work for NASA. And he's like, no, oh, okay, I just like pudding. Yeah, Bouxy for sure. Grav, I think where Bill lacks in, you know, being a hype man for NASA, he makes up for in his political competency when it comes to spaceflight. I can't speak to anything else, but the guy knows what he's talking about with spaceflight. Like, you, you could, he has his own special way of saying it, but you know he knows what's going on. Yeah, but I think I think Bill has a lot more experience in politics than even Jim does, you know? Jim is good. He did good, you know, well, he, I mean, I'm not going to say he did, you know, like, good, like, oh, his, you know, well, his policies that he implemented were good, blah, 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 blah. No, not anything like that. I mean, he, he, served, he served his time in Congress, and you didn't ever hear about him. And I have a theory about politicians. <laughs> My theory about politicians is if you they're, they're they're like a background process on your computer. If a background process on your computer acts up, then you hear about it, right? But for the most part, it's a background process. You know, politicians that you hear about, right? You know, you hear for every politicians you hear about, there's like a hundred of them that you don't hear about that are doing a good job because you never hear about them. You know, that's just a personal theory. I, I don't know if that's true or not. Maybe. Just like it, bingo. It's like a referee at a sporting event, Pete. You know, like, if the refs do a good job, the refs won't be the talk of the game. Right? If the refs are doing a great job and they made all the right fair calls, I know, imagine in this day and age. Right? If they're doing their job correctly, you should never know their names. You shouldn't even know their names. They're just another, they're just the, the referee. Same thing with, you know, European football. Same thing with, you know, soccer. Same thing with baseball. You should never, ever know the umpires' names. You shouldn't. That shouldn't be relevant information. But there's umpires that I know. There's refereeing crews in football that I know because they make terrible calls. You know? Yeah, Grav, I know what you mean. You know, like... If you hear about a refing crew from a sporting event, it, that means they did something wrong. Nobody ever says, yeah, that refing crew did a great job. But everyone says, nope, they screwed it up. They, they didn't call anything right. They had no idea what they were talking about. They, this call, which was questionable, decided the game, etc., etc. Same idea. I never heard of Jim Bridenstine until he was nominated. That's how I know that, you know... Like there's and like I said, it's not like I know what party Jim's from. I, you know, there's other parties. Like I get it. It's, it has nothing to do with that. The politicians that are in the background are the ones that are working for you that you don't hear about. You know, regardless of where they come from. Cough, cough, Joe West, bingo. <laughs> the NHL Player Safety Association would like a word. <laughs> no, Mikey, no, no, it's so not right. But, like, once again, that's just a personal theory, guys. I know. I know. I'm, I sent that one out, and people are going to send it back saying, like, no. That's that's fine. Like, 
I'm speaking, it's a personal anecdote. Like, that's not anecdote. That's not the right way to say that. It's just kind of, I don't know. That's how I see things, you know? Angel Hernandez, don't get me started, Winter Scythe. Do not get me started. <laughs> Juice Pop, that's, that's what won me over with Jim. Jim was, he was a climate skeptic. He's like, I'm not so sure about that. And then when he went to NASA administrator, he's like, yep, I saw the data. No, that's real. Yeah, that's absolutely real. Yeah, that's absolutely the thing. We, we, we should, we should, we should fix that. We should fix that like now, sooner rather than later. I respect a man that can change his mind, you know, after, you know, weighing the facts and, you know, having the truth stare you in the face, being like, not being like, nah, but being like, okay, all right, I got you. Yep. All right. Let's, let's work together to fix this. I like that. That it was that point where I was like, Jim's all right. This guy should be NASA administrator right there. Mike Massey, bingo. Everyone knows who Mike Massey is. And it's not for a good reason. You were wrong about everything ever. Three hundred SA page. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I know. I know. I'll probably get a probably get a Discord message from someone saying like, "No, I don't think that." Yeah, but that's fine. Eh? People can disagree. And you know what? Even if somebody wrote me a three hundred page essay about why they disagree, I'd probably read it. As long as they were civil and coming from a coming from a not a place of innocence, but as, as long as they stay civil and make some good points, I'd listen because I, I like being like Jim. That's that's how an adult acts. Ch children are the ones that freak out when you show them truth. No, that's not right. Like, don't act like a child. Am I right? Like, with that being said, you know, we talk about constellation, I get a little mad. Like, you know. Something like that, Thomas, yeah. Yeah, Angel Hernandez, Shaw. Oh, Angel Hernandez, Joe West, dude. I don't. I. I should never know these guys' names, but we know their names. Yeah, because they suck. How about the bonehead that uh, in the um, in the Red Sox Astros ALCS last year? Here, hold on. Yeah, here you go. Here you go. Look at this. All right. So, this this was this is from the this is from the final game. If the if so that's Nate Evaldi pitching. If he strikes this guy out, the game's over. The Red Sox go to the World Series basically, right? So, I don't know if you guys know about baseball. If you don't know about baseball, that's fine. Baseball isn't the point here. I'm not trying to get you to like baseball. Just bear with me here. See this plate right here? That's home plate in baseball. If the pitcher throws the ball and the ball is over, so the, the plate has a, an imaginary 3D space that goes up, okay? The, imagine a, a 3D box right here, okay? Anything that's over that plate is a strike, but the strike zone, it, there's also height limitations to it. If it's below the knees, it's it's a ball, okay? Which means, you and if, uh, and if it's above the guy's shoulders, basically, there's a box that's right here. That's the shape of home plate, right? So it's a 3D box right there. Anything that's inside of that is a strike. You get three strikes and you're out. You swing and a miss, you're out. Foul ball, it's a strike. But you can't, you can't strike out on a foul ball on the third strike. You throw four bad pitches, the guy gets, the guy gets on base, right? And you know, then you go around and the guy scores, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now. That box that I told you about. That's in the box. They called that a ball. And the Red Sox lost because of it. Is that ball over the plate? Is that ball below the guy's shoulders, above the guy's knees? And over the plate? Yes, yes, and yes. It's a strike. Even the strike zone indicator on the TV said it was a strike. Guy called it a ball. Yep, Red Sox lost. And then the Astros the Astros won, and I tipped my cap. They're a good team. And then they lost the World Series. 
Okay. Is there a video re review in baseball? Sometimes can't have. It depends on what it is. Yep. Yep. Mistakes happens. Oops, we canceled Aries. Yeah, yeah, right. Like I said, I don't want to know about umpires. I don't want to know your name. I don't want to know. You. I don't want to know you. I don't want to know who you are. I know that. Yeah, the umpire's name. Mm -hmm. Okay, Angel Hernandez, C.B. Buckner, Joe West. I know a bunch of MLB umpires, and I didn't want to know that information, but I know them because you suck. Yeah, because you suck. Anyway, it's okay. It's all Jays and Rays this year. Not if I have anything to say about it, Troll. Well, I being the Red Sox, a baseball team that I am not on. You get what I'm trying to say. Yep, yep. Yeah, yeah. If they're in the background, not saying anything, good politician. There you go. Or good umpire, good referee. Pick your pick your pick your thing. You know. <laughs> anyway, let's jump into what else is going on with space news. So the first thing is that Mike Baylor took this picture. He's setting up his remotes for NASA space flight. There, Falcon Nine is on the pad for the L eighty five mission, but it is it's going to go tomorrow at around nine o'clock. So that's uh three hours before normal start time for me, for anybody, anybody that's wondering when that launch is going to be. It was supposed to be Friday morning, then it scrubbed to this morning, and last night it scrubbed to Sunday. Uh, additional mission assurance or something. Uh, this is a reconnaissance office mission here. Um, yeah. It's a reconnaissance office mission. We don't know what it is. It, Thomas, you said it could be this type of satellite or whatever, but... Anyway, Angel is a disgrace to the game. Yeah, damn right. You screwed up so many times. It's unbelievable. Let's see. Jack has some good pictures here. There you go. Nice. Yeah, that booster 1071 supported the L87 mission. <laughs> Naval reconnaissance satellite. Yep. I wonder if it has involuntary submarine detection. Anyway. Um, football, when you only kick once or twice, it, an imaginative, and then an imaginative, you're out box. Fun. you know what? You know we call it football just to piss you off, right? I understood that reference. <laughs> anyway. What's the next bit of space news? Uh, so Vega, the ESA's Vega rocket, they posted this. They're getting closer to the inaugural Vega C VV-21 launch with Lares 2. Lares 2. Start of the integration process of the P-120C solid rocket stage. So the P-120C right there is the first stage for the Vega rocket, for the Vega C. But it's also the the attachable booster for Ariane 6. So that's actually a pretty good mission. It's, it's pretty cool. Hopefully this thing performs really well. Do we have any cruisers in our Navy that can become submarines too? Or are we behind technologically? Um, b behind. Yeah. Behind. Yeah. 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 See, there's a method for transporting SRBs. If we were going to do some constellation style integration, I would use Ariane Space's way of integration, going back to the KSP2 thing. Or KSP, not KSP2, KSP1 mission mode 2 architecture. You catch this yesterday? We talked about nuclear engines, Lavi, and I went, I, I, yeah, I used it as a way to teach people about, about them, about neutron flux and. Then that moved into a material science discussion about thermal coefficient and heat flux. Nobis, I remembered. I remembered. Yeah. Nuclear Raptor when. Also interesting write-up about L85. Yeah. It's a cool mission patch. 
All right, so check this out. On top of that, we got another dragon capsule ready to go. Got another dragon capsule ready to go here for the commercial crew program. Uh, <clears throat> uh, this is Crew Dragon Freedom. Nice. This is basically following the Axiom 1 mission, which launched Dragon Endeavor uh, up to the space station. Uh, and speaking of Axiom, Axiom will, the Axiom 1 mission will be down next week. They're still up there. Everything's going good with that as far as I know. Literally, back-to-back -back crew launches on 39A uh, with, with, uh, with Falcon 9s. That's, that's pretty cool, man. Nice, nice pick of C212 right there. Another one with the worm on the nacelles. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Naked dragon. Yeah, well, no, no, no. She's covered up. She's covered up. Yep. There it is. It's got covers on the solar panels to prevent them from getting messed up. That's what all these... That's what all this stuff is. I was on Playa Linda Beach five miles away for the a AX-1 launch. It was freaking awesome. Isn't it cool, Lloyd? Yeah. It's good stuff, man. And you know, like, like I said, fellas, you know, a little bit of a, you know, epilogue to the whole Constellation conversation, man. Like, you know, I'm pissed that Constellation got canceled and that still sucks. And I'm, I'm probably never going to let that one go until we have something similar, right? Like our SLS gets working or we land people on the moon or something like that. But it's, I would be remiss in saying that I'm, this is pretty freaking cool. That's pretty cool. Yeah, this is good. This is a good thing. Yeah. You know, and if we get Starship out of it, maybe, maybe, maybe I'll think about letting that one go. Maybe. <laughs> you know, this, this is pretty good. This isn't bad. There are four. Endeavor, Resilience, Endurance, and Freedom. Those are good names. What's the scale here for Dragon? Uh, Dragon's with the trunk is about two stories tall, give or take. Yeah, it's about two stories tall. Something like that. Starship. It'll happen, sequels. Um, you know, like I said, one of the, you know, if you, if there's a decision out there that you don't like, you know, you should be able to weigh positive and negatives. I don't like that Constellation was canceled. But I will say this, NASA was unbelievably right in the time at seeing the potential that SpaceX could grow into, okay? And I, I'm not sure if that's necessarily because SpaceX is a commercial entity, but, you know, they saw, I mean, Elon, that guy works, and he, he sets that kind of culture of working hard at SpaceX. Now, I know people are, no, he doesn't, yet. I get it, I get it, I get it, I get it. But, you know, space, gambling on SpaceX was a good idea. That was a good call. I will say that's a good idea. I'm not sure if we'll truly understand at what cost that happened, but hey, you know what, man? It is in the past. All I do is try to use this to teach people about, you know, bad space flight policy, but that was a good decision. That was a good call. SpaceX just tweeted that all systems and weather are looking good for L85. Cool, cool. Cool, cool. The Slick 4 Transporter Erector needs some love kind of looking scorchy. But yeah, we got another one. This mission is set to go out. Uh, this is the Crew 4 mission here that's set to go out uh, on the 23rd. Yep. So check this out, guys. Look at this. The next four missions that are on rocketlaunch.live here. L85, Falcon 9, reusable, obviously. Then we have on Slick 40, there's another Falcon 9 being put together. Starlink 42 on the 21st. Then after that, there's Electron. They're in back again. Rocket Lab's attempt to first mid-air helicopter capture an Electron rocket. Reuse, reusable mission. And then there's a Falcon 9 launching right after that with a reusable capsule and a reusable first stage. The next four flights all have reuse. Pretty cool, huh? Man, next week is going to be sweet. Next week is going to be awesome. <laughs> Dragon.
Dragon Capsule. Yeah, next week's gonna be great, man. It's gonna be it's gonna be fantastic. Starlink 414 is on 1060.12. Another one hitting the 12th flight mark. Yeah, B Money, I don't care. Early times, though? 11.15. Nah. During the day, Mutter? That's right. Ideally, it would be nice if we, like, 5 p.m. launches, like right around when I do Space News, are the best time. Because that's when everybody's home, you know. But these launches are fine. Uh, Electron's at 6.35. See, that's a, that's a banger right there. That's perfect. And then Crew 4 is at 5.20 frick a.m. That's not, that's not so good, but orbital dynamics. Pain in the butt. Any during the race? No, no. Crew 4 is before Imola. Yeah. And then what's after that? We have a Long March, PSLV, Electron Capstone on the... Whoa, the capstone mission is that close? So, Electron, it's TB, TBD, okay. So, this Electron mission right here, that's happening two weeks out from now, the capstone mission, that's gonna, Electron's gonna send a CubeSat to the moon, and it's going to pathfind Gateway's rectilinear halo orbit. They're basically gonna put a locator probe out there, a little CubeSat, to figure out what's the best orbit that Gateway should be in. Yeah, that's cool. Net May 3rd for, for Capstone. Yeah, that's really cool. Orbital dynamics must become illegal. Yeah, right. And then, oh yeah, a month from now. A month from now. Discovery, go at throttle up. You know what I just realized, guys? There is a potential here. Ah, uh, no, there's not really potential for it, but, uh... Ah, oh, man. I was gonna say, there's a potential there to have a Falcon 9 with a Dragon, Atlas with a Starliner, and SLS with an Orion, all on the same pad at the same time, but Falcon wouldn't be there. Uh, there would be no Dragon capsule set to go in May. Except for, I think, a resupply mission. I think it was CRS-25. There's a possibility that there could be three capsules on three different pads with three different rockets in, in late May. Well, that'll be a nice picture, don't you think? See, that's right there. Yep, yep. You know what? You know what? Canceling Constellation sucked, but I don't mind that. I will say that. I don't mind that. That's pretty good. That's pretty, that's pretty nice. <laughs> hey, Aardvark, 77 month resub, thank you. Yeah, yeah, that would be, that would be really cool. Is there any, uh, there's a resupply mission for SpaceX on the 7th. That's when it's tentatively scheduled. And it, th that's CRS-220, SpaceX-25 is on, uh, is on, um, 39A. So, yeah. I mean, at the very least, guys, yeah, we could have Starliner and SLS out there. Yeah. I mean, at the very least, it would just be Starliner because SLS might be in the VAB on the 19th. They have to roll back after the wet dress rehearsal. So it could be, I don't know, it could be. Well, because of the docking port limit, I don't think we'd see Dragon and Starliner up at the same time yet, but definitely by Artemis too. Well, that, that would be pretty good. Every cloud has silver lining. Yep. Yep. That's if SpaceX doesn't come out with their own moon lander. A SD NASA is paying them to make a lander for them. So, they are coming out with their moon lander. And NASA, NASA is paying them for it. <laughs> okay. The station needs some extra support. Speed up, Axiom. Thomas, I still think that Shooting Star has the capability of being an extra pressurized mating adapter. And, like, I think it could with some retrofitting on orbit. You could do that. I think that's a really good idea because doesn't the front of Shooting Star... We've talked about this before. Doesn't the front of Shooting Star use an IDSS, but it's a passive IDSS?
What happened to PMA3? PMA3 right now has a Dragon Capsule docked to it. PMA2 also has a Dragon Capsule docked to it. Pressurized Mating Adapter 1? T-Man, where do you think it is? This is a, this is, this is a trivia Get question. No where's, where's, where's PMA1? Because there's three of them. Isn't Starship their lunar lander? It is, killer. Yep. Starship HLS. ISS is looking like an old computer with not enough USB ports. Yeah, right? Adapters on adapters, man. Doctors, 8-month resub. Thank you. Is it in the ocean? Nope. It's in space. Pressurized mating adapter 1. Is it in heaven? No. All right. All right, fellas, here we go. Let's go into Maya, I'll show you. Somebody got it, but I won't say who. Okay, so PMA3 is right there. It has IDA2, or no, IDA3 attached to it. That's the adapter for Dragon and Starliner. See this, see this ring right here? The pressurized mating adapter was originally made to, to adapt the CBM, common birthing mechanism, right there. CBM to APAS 95. APAS 95 was the shuttle's docking port. Right? Give it a second. So these pressurized mating adapters adapt space station module to space shuttle. Why are they crooked? So they could see where, so why are they like offset like that? It's because when they're docking the shuttle, the windows for being able to see where you're docking are right here. So you could look at what you're docking against. Yeah. Um, here, I'll show you. I know if someone's gonna ask, why is that bent? Well, it's bent because when the shuttle docks to it, they need to be able to see the docking port, right? And there's two windows on the top of the shuttle that face this way, but there's also two windows that face into the payload bay. And the docking port for the shuttle is in the payload bay. So you have to be able to look down directly at the docking port. So those windows are pointing down like this, and the docking port is right here. So when you go to dock, they, they bent the port in so it went into the shuttle's payload bay so they could see the target and also be able to look down at the docking. Yep. That's why it's bent. There's another good picture. See? It's bent so they could see the dang thing. Yep. Hey, Blanning. What's up? Can't be in the ocean yet. So, there's the shuttle dock to PMA2 right there. There's PMA3. They moved it. It was over there. Um, yeah, see, it's attached right there. You can't see it. The solar panel's in the way. But, nowadays, PMA3 is up here. It's on the, uh, the zenith of Node 2, which is Harmony, which is this module right here. The one in the center, not the one on the sides. That's the Columbus module. That's European Space Agency. This is Kibo. Kibo and the G, G, JEM, Japanese, ex, uh, Japanese Experiment Module. And then Kibo is the storage module right there. PMA2 is right here. I just showed you a picture of Atlantis docked to it. PMA2 has IDA2 on it. Where is IDA1? Bottom of the ocean. Yep. CRS-7. Mission didn't make it. They had spares, though. They had two spares. Right there and right there. So, where's PMA-1? There's, see, PMA-3, pressurized mating adapter 2. PMA-1 is still on the ISS, but it's over here. 
PMA-1 is the adapter that adapts the international, the, the USOS and the Russian segment. It, it adapts the international modules to the Russian segment. See? See, there it is right there. PMA-1. Yep. The reason why... The reason why is because Zarya, or the Functional Cargo Block, FGB for short, Functional Cargo Block, the Zarya module, which is the core module of the space station, right? Has an APAS-95 port at the front. Now, I know what you're thinking. Well, why does, why does the Functional Cargo Block have a shuttle docking module on the front? Because I said that the PMA is adapted to the shuttle's docking port. Well, what if I told you that every single mission that the shuttle flew in with a docking port to dock to a space, a space, space dock to a space station, used a Russian docking port? Oh yeah, the shuttle flew its entire career using a Russian docking port to dock to Mir and the ISS. Yep. Yeah, I know. So. How do they get that design? What do you mean? How do they get that, like, what? What do you, okay, so they adapted a Russian docking port for the shuttle? Well, kind of. Kind of. You could, you could say that. Anybody remember this? See that docking ring right there? At the end of the Cold War, they just took that docking ring and modified it to work with the shuttle. And it used A-Pass because Buran was designed to dock to that module. Yeah. Would Freedom have used A-Pass? No. Probably not. And fun fact, Soyuz flew with it as well to Mir. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Yeah, see that? They took Buran's, not the exact thing, but they took the design for Buran's docking port. And because we were working with the Russians and we needed to we needed to put two, two of these ports together, it'd be easier to get the shuttle to fly with a port that was already designed to fly in a shuttle, not the shuttle, but it was a shuttle nonetheless. They took that design, modified it to work with an airlock, and made it a piece that could go inside of the shuttle's payload bay. That would make operations up at the space station easier for when, for when NASA and the Russian space program at the time went to do STS-88, the first ISS assembly mission. Check it out. There's PMA-1 and PMA-2. The Russians put Zarya up there on a proton rocket. The shuttle went, found the dang thing, wrangled it with the robotic arm, right and attached it to node one think about how crazy of a freaking mission this actually is okay so kerbal players all right think about this for a moment the shuttle had to go up it went up with this inside of the payload bay so pma1 node one unity and pma2 and then it had the docking adapter in it the Buran derived docking ring with the A pass port. It was an A pass 75 at the time for the technical people. The shuttle had to pull this out of its payload bay, install that onto the docking ring, and then fly around like this with the docking ring attached to it. It had to fly around to Zarya and then grab Zarya and attach that to these modules. It flew around with with a space with part of a space station docked to it in space. Think about how complicated of a mission that actually is. Anybody that plays Kerbal knows that doing something like that is bananas. They did it in real life. And we, we sit here and wonder why no one wants to get rid of the ISS. Well, that thing was hard to make, man. Yeah, the shuttle attached a space station to itself because Unity, the Unity module, and PMA-1 and PMA-2 they don't have any propulsion systems. Those are just space station modules. No RCS, no onboard guidance. Its guidance system is over here. It's attached to that thing. No, they didn't steal it. The US and the Russian space program after 1991 
started working together, Creeper. They still do, even now. 30 years later, we still work together. Yeah, crazy, right? Isn't that nuts? That's absolutely ridiculous. Well, we financed that launch, Green Dragon. We financed the launch of of, of Zarya. We, we technically bought it, but the Russians operate it. Sim literally like commercial crew. It's the same thing, only with nation to nation instead of nation to commercial provider. I think Streamer is building a rocket in his backyard. Nah. I don't try to build a rocket, Blanning. I don't feel like losing a hand or something. I, I build cars. Yeah, that's what I do. Was most of the station put together like that with the shuttle cannon arm or the modules have their own propulsion? Bagel Buddy, the only modules that have propulsion on the space station are Zarya and Zvezda and Nauka. So Zarya, Zvezda, and Nauka. Those are the only three. That's it. N you know, none of those, none of these modules from PMA-1 forward, basically anything that's not highlighted, have a propulsion system. That has a propulsion system, that has a propulsion system, and that has the propulsion system. The Russian modules make up the service and propulsion system for the space station. It's the service module. Service and propulsion. Especially the, the one that does it the most is Vezda. Right there. How did Piers Poisk and Rasvet get up there? Rasvet? Space shuttle. Yep. See? They took... So, okay, there's another cool story here. Um, Rasvet is a mere docking, a mere core, core module. It was derived from the mere docking module. Here, I'll show you. Mere docking module. It was derived from the mere docking module. Who really knows their history? What was the mirror docking module that derived from? Who really knows what they're talking about? Let's see. Zvezda is star and Zarya is dawn. Yep. Mm -hmm. Russians have cool names for their stuff. They do. They do. Their space stuff. Yeah. That's right, Thomas. Yep. The mirror docking module is derived from Apollo Soyuz test project. Adapter. Crazy, right? Look at it. It's the same thing. Nuts, huh? I'd have to go find sources to prove it. If you don't believe me, that's fair. But it's derived from that. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Thomas, you got it. Yeah, it's derived from the docking adapter. That already has a Russian docking port on one side. Granted, they don't really use that docking ring anymore, but that does look like the IDSS, huh? And A-Pass, for what it's worth. The Russians just took the Apollo side off and just put another one on to make the Mir docking module. And because they were working with the Americans again, it was a good design that everybody was familiar with. Smart, huh? It's pretty cool. So that's how Rasvet got up there. It got up there by the shuttle, because the shuttle, they had experience in doing something like that. The reason why we put that up there is because they had it. They had one already. They made they made two for Mir, and this was the backup, and they put it on the ISS. Well, yeah, that's A-Pass 75. I know. Cool, huh? Yeah. That module can trace its routes right back to the Apollo program. Cool, huh? So, how did Piers and Poist get up there? Um... Soyuz. Actually, technically progress. They just took they just took the crew module off and used the Soyuz service module. Yep. Straight up. It's just a progress. It's a progress capsule with no capsule and no orbital module. They just put the space station module there instead. 
smart. That's that's really smart engineering. I, I will say that's pretty damn smart. Yep. Yeah, they France the Soyuz. They cut off its head. That's right. There it is. Yeah, that's right. Pritchell is up there. I forgot about that. Pritchell is up on the ISS. Man, I remember when that thing was in pieces on the ground. Huh. There's Rasved right there. Yeah, they just... And then to deorbit the old one, they just attached a progress to it and disconnected it because it uses a Soyuz docking port because it was launched on a, well, Soyuz-derived launch vehicle, progress, right? Pretty crazy. Yeah, it's a cool idea. So yeah, that's how those got up there. But Piers, Poisk, Rasvet do not have propulsion systems. One, that was brought up by the shuttle, so it doesn't have any. These are just docking rings. And they're, they're simultaneously a docking port and an airlock. That's what that side hatch is for. See that? And then Pritchal is down here. So it has something kind of like... If I just duplicate this down there. Kind of looks like that. Kind of. Not exactly, but yeah. None of these modules up here that were delivered by the space shuttle have propulsion systems. The space shuttle assembled it like STS-88. Uh, yeah, see? So, there were, it was really cool. When the sh guys, like, that's what I mean, dude. There's a reason why I like the shuttle so much. It's really good for do doing stuff like this. You wouldn't be able to do this so much with, like, commercial crew or anything, but... So the shuttle would go up there, right? It would have the module in its payload bay, and at first, what they would do is they would take the shuttle, and the shuttle would use its, uh, uh, the, S uh, the shuttle manipulation system. So Canadarm 1... One, Canadarm1 one is the one that's on the shuttle. They would use Canadarm1 to just install components. And then, during one of these missions, they brought up Canadarm2, which is the SSRMS, Space Station Remote Manipulator. That's still up there. Yeah, it's still up there, and it, they use it as a construction crane to fix the space station, and, and they use it to catch payloads like Cygnus. Uh, it'll be used to wrangle Dream Chaser. They used it to catch Dragon back in the day. Um... Dragon 1, not Dragon 2. Dragon 2 autonomously docks now. Commercial and cargo. Um, and when they when they got the second RMS up there, uh, what they like, what they could do is they could use the space shuttle's arm, grab the module, pull it out, extend it, and Space Station 2 arm would, could grab it and then install it. It's pretty cool, huh? Another thing that a lot of people don't know is that Canada arms can monkey bar around where the space station RS the space the, the space station R, RMS can monkey bar around meaning that it has the same docking port front and back and anytime you see the dinner plate with the three teardrops on it that's a grapple point for the arm they can plug the arm in here and the arm will grapple to it and it'll plug itself in for power so when I say it'll monkey bar around, it can grab one thing. Think about like a climber going up a mountain. You grab one thing, you hold on to it, and then you use your other arm to grab another thing. Then you let that one go, and then you grab another thing. You can monkey bar around with the RMS. So they can, they can literally put this arm anywhere on the space station that has a grapple point, and they'll be able to control it all from one... From one uh, actually, there's multiple vantage points. There's three points on this... Or no two points on the ISS where they can control the arm from. One of them is the one that makes the most sense, the cupola module. You can control the RMS from there. And then there's a remote manipulator station on the destiny module right there. The, the US laboratory has a has an RMS station where you can use the arm remotely from there. Or you can look out the window and use it. Once again, any one of these grapple fixtures right here, that's the bullseye for, the, for them to line up to make sure that the arm is aligned. And then they, then the teardrops are how it kind of locks itself in. And then there's an auxiliary plug somewhere that will plug itself in, and they could power the arm. Now, want me to really blow your mind? You want to, you want to know how complicated this is? For the people that don't know, look at this thing up here. See that thing? It has a bunch of grapple points on it, and then it has an extra fixture right there. See that? It has an extra, you know, Canadarm remote manipulator um, 
Grapple hook. See this thing? You guys remember the monorail thing from The Simpsons? What if I told you the ISS has a train built into it? Because it does. That thing can move back and forth, and the arms can attach to it. That's how they go out and mess with the solar panels when they need to, because it's on a track system. Yeah, really freaking cool. Yeah, that's how they installed the IROSA solar panels. Uh, they basically attach the arm to this, and then they use the arm to pull the solar panel out of out of Dragon's trunk, and then whoosh, brought it over there. Note that they parked Dragon with the IROSAs, I think was parked up here, so they, they could get the arm up and over into the trunk on Dragon, pull it out, and then move the whole space train out to the solar panels and install the modules out there. Also, if we were talking about the Return to Space documentary, they talked about Chris Cassidy and Bob Benkin swapping out batteries on the ISS. Well, there's your batteries right there. See them? They're on the uh, P4 and S4 truss segments. There's two, there's two sets of battery, pattern, well, there's actually four sets. Each solar panel array has its own set of batteries. So there's, um, there's S4, S6, and P4, P6 right there. See? There's another set of batteries there. There's another set of batteries there. If you go all the, other, all the way down the other way, there's another set right there, and then there's another set right there. Nickel hydrogen batteries is what they used. IROSA delivery missions used PMA3. Yep. I'm telling you, man, the ISS is really freaking cool. We should build another one. I mean, but they're trying to do that with commercial low Earth orbit destinations. But this is all, it's a really cool piece of equipment. It's complicated, but worth it. Apps are freaking lootly. Yep. She's a beast, isn't she? It's, it's crazy. It's a crazy piece of equipment. Are Axiom slotted to launch a propulsion module? Uh, eventually, yeah. Mm -hmm. but yeah, that's, that's not going to happen until like 2024, 2025. It's huge. It's about the size of a soccer field, guys. Yeah, or a football field. Yeah. Or a football field, you know. What? There's the different types of football, man. I get it. I get it. One's, one's weird name. Yeah, shut up. Shh. Shh. Shut up. No. Football field or soccer field or football field, okay? <laughs> yep, she's big. Bold. Is, on the topic of ad docking ports and adapters, is the Androgynous system that Dragon used better than Probe and Drogue of Apollo and Soyuz? If so, how? Um, so that's the International Docking System Standard. The IDSS takes is derived from APAS-95. Yeah, believe it or not. It's derived from a Russian docking module because everyone likes APAS. APAS is a good system. They stopped flying APAS when the shuttle stopped flying. So they came up with the IDSS. It's a new docking port type that everybody can use. It takes all the best parts about a Soyuz, Apollo, uh, APAS, uh, which is what the shuttle used. It takes all the best parts out of each one of those things and, and combines them into one system. Um, funny thing is, is that some Chinese modules have, ID, have, a, have something that's APAS derived on them too. Uh, technically, they could dock they could they could interface. I'm not sure if you'd get power or anything, but they could interface, yeah. So it takes the IDSS is kind of the best of all the docking ports. I'd like to point out that Orion also has an IDSS on it as well. Starliner, Dragon, Orion all have the same forward docking port, yeah. Orion could technically still go to the ISS. It could it could you could do it. I don't know with what rocket, but you could do it. Yeah, cool little bit of history about the ISS. It's pretty neat, huh? 
it's a cool piece of equipment, and the shuttles, the shuttles that built it are even cooler in my mind, but, yeah. Yep, yep. Last, I am sad now. Looking at Dream Chaser and Shooting Star, uh, give me a second, grab. Looking at Dream Chaser and Shooting Star, there's no IDSS connecting them together. It's just something like a normal payload separation ring. Nah, it's gotta be IDSS derived. It has to be, Thomas. How, Thomas, okay, the reason why I think it, I, I'm so adamant that it has to be international docking system standard derived is because how does Dream Chaser move people to the ISS? They're not going to berth it when people are on board. There's no way. And Dream Chaser at one point had a plan to autonomously dock to the ISS. It was a requirement for the commercial crew program. And don't get me wrong, it's not like they just said, oh, keep using the human rated component even though we're launching it un uncrewed, right? There's, They probably changed it to something else, but it, whatever they changed it to, it, it's got to be a passive IDSS. It has to be. There's no way that it isn't. Anyway, grab. Last, just watch the beginning. I has a sad now. We just had to retire the shuttle program. I had a conniption, grab shark. I was like. <laughs> Ow! Help! Make it stop! Discovery, go and throttle up. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it's annoying. Yeah, it's annoying. <laughs> it's like that scene in The Fifth Element. I am... disappointed. And if it's one thing I do not like to be, it is to be... disappointed. Sorry, sir. This will never happen again. I know. <laughs> Bali, Ted. Barkwell, 65-month resub. Thank you very much. <laughs>